Sup y'all, it's me, it's yo boy fanfic audiobooks, enjoy the story, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Also comment what you want to see next in the channel, let's start. Chapter 45, Emotional Support Once the two siblings had somewhat collected themselves, Elfman realized they had an audience. So, you guys wanna come say hello? Or are you just going to stand around staring at the world's most manly living dead man? He asked. For three seconds his guildmates just stared back at him before suddenly a massive cheer rang out amongst the group. Almost as one, the fairy charged forward into one of the biggest group hugs in history. Every member of the guild was trying to reach in to at least touch their comrade, to confirm for their own senses that he was really walking amongst them once more. Elfman took it all in stride, hugging, shaking hands, high fives and knuckle bumping everyone he could. His laughter was echoing throughout the cemetery, casting a somewhat cheerful glow over a place normally filled with unhappiness. Fairy tale. Makarov's voice suddenly boomed across the clearing. The mags halted what they were doing and all turned to see the little man, now standing comfortably atop what had once been Elfman's tomb. I think we've trampled on the townsfolk's graves enough for today, don't you all? The old man asked in amusement. What do you say we leave this place for the corpses, and we all head back to the guild? I believe it's time for a party. With a roar of approval, the mob reversed their stampede and headed back towards the town. Myra Jane held Elfman back with a light hand on her shoulder and a wide smile. For once, Elfman hung back from the huge mob of shoving, smiling friends and walked side by side with her at a normal pace. So, what was it like? Myra Jane eventually asked. Being dead. It was strange. Turns out we are sorted into heaven and hell by a gigantic pink troll in a suit. That's, are you being serious? Completely. I tried to argue with him so that I could find out where Lee's Anna was. You tried to argue with the guy that decides where you have to spend eternity. That's, I don't think you are ever going to be able to top that in terms of manliness Elfman. It will be a manly challenge. I'm sure you'll find a way, returning from the grave is a nice start. Myra Jane speculated cheerfully. Elfman started chuckling and his sister was quick to join in, the pair just basking in each other's presence. In just a couple of minutes the other fairies had completely vanished from view, all except for one walking a few dozen yards ahead of them. Myra Jane smiled even larger when she noticed the red hair and shouted out, Urza, come and say hello to Elfman already. Urza turned around and looked at the pair, she held no smile, no cheery greeting, she just stared. Elfman, make sure that you do not squander this second chance. The knight said blandly before she turned back towards the road and picked up the pace. Elfman faltered slightly, confusion clear on his face. Did I do something? I don't think so. Myra Jane blinked. I think she might be mad at me, actually. After we fused to fight Flute I, may have said some pretty harsh stuff her. Huh? Elfman just raised an eyebrow. You had just died. Myra explained, I lashed out, she was there. Myra sighed. I'll apologize later. Wait, you two fused. Elfman said incredulously. Myra Jane started as she remembered that her brother had no idea what had happened after he had died. I'll make sure to catch you up on everything later. But right now, there's probably going to be so much alcohol at the guild we might not totally remember this conversation. Ah, the manliest type of amnesia is self-inflicted. Waiting is probably for the best. But when you have that talk with Urza, try to remember to make sure that you're somewhere uninhabited. Hmm, we are acting a lot more like how we were as kids, aren't we? And we are already on our third guild hall in under a year, that might be for the best. Good. And maybe while you're sorting that out, I'll start asking Levi to research dimension magic. Elfman said quietly. Mira Jane's face turned tender, and she reached out to hug her brother's arm. 
we'll figure it out. I don't care what we have to do, summon that dragon again, forcing that old fortune teller to help, or just ripping a hole in space, we are going to be a full family again. Count on it. S and DS 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 and SS and DS and DS and DS and DS and D. Urza strolled down the street of Magnolia, ignoring the many greetings sent her way by the citizens and wandering mags. She was calm. She was in control. Everything was fine. What Titania had done to her, what she was still doing to her, it was changing her, changing her for the better. She felt powerful, her body thrummed with so much raw magical energy, it was a wonder it hadn't torn itself to pieces. Spells that once taxed her, now became effortless. Her dimensional. Requip space had tripled in size overnight. Then tripled again the next. Her house of spare armors, weapons, and outfits now stood empty, cleared of all contents save for the useless outfits her fellow members had given her as gifts. She had no need of those. When she had gone on a mission to deal with some dark mage bandits preying on the aid shipments to the city, she had attempted to find an upper limit to how many weapons she could summon. She had failed. Her entire arsenal had materialized with only the slightest strain, blotting out the sun with a cloud of flying steel, the bandits had surrendered on the spot. Not that it stopped her from killing them. She could still picture them lying on the ground, their hands in the air, pleading as they were shredded by countless blades. And she felt no regret. Why should she? Their wanted posters had said dead or alive, and the mags had made their choice when they decided to prey upon the weak like the lowly animals they were. There was no shame in putting down a mad dog. The alternative would have been dragging them back to town, handing them over to the rune kinks. Which would only allow them to be a drain on food and water that could go to those more deserving. A waste of time, effort, and resources all around. Killing them had been a far more effective solution. It had been right. Inside her head, hidden behind tranquil eyes, Urza screamed. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Ten Jewels says it's something practical. Droy muttered into Jet's ear. Twenty says it's something stupid. Jet whispered right back. When Goku had a stack of books the size of his torso he made his way back over to the desk. Levi darted over to peek over his shoulder, and her excited gaze turned confused. Beginner's Guide to Woodcutting She read aloud. Goku looked over smiled when he saw who was next to him. Hey there Levi, what's going on? He asked. I was just curious what kind of books you were getting. Levi said. Ham? Oh, I got tired of not having a house, so I've decided to make my own. Goku answered nonchalantly. Pay up. Droy said. What? No. That's not practical, it's stupid, you can't just build a house from reading library books. You pay up. Well, good luck. Said Levi, distracted by the squabbling behind her. Just make sure you take care of those books, or else. Yes, m. Goku saluted with a grin. Goku's next stop was the guild hall, where he immediately walked over to Makarov. Hey Gramps, I'm out of money, but I don't have time to go on a job for the next day or two. Could you let me borrow some money? Pretty please. Makarov shifted uncomfortably before hardening his resolve and raising his voice so that most of the guild could hear. Goku. I actually have something along those lines I need to tell you. Goku listened as his master explained how he had actually had the rights to millions of jewels, only for Makarov to sign them all away to pay off the council. I'm sorry, Goku. Makarov finished quietly. I should have told that snake. I'm gonna stop you right there. Goku interrupted, clapping his hand on the tiny man's shoulder. Gramps, don't worry about it. Goku said seriously. He didn't totally understand the details of what had driven Makarov to do this, but he could quite literally see the anguish in his master's eyes. And that upset him far worse than than the thought of the millions of lost jewels he hadn't even known about five minutes ago. Goku. Makarov swallowed. Come on master, I know you. If that lawyer had asked you to screw me over or to chop off your own arm, you'd tell him to fetch you an axe. Isn't that right guys, he finished, address the horde of eavesdroppers around. Damn straight. We forgive YA Gramps. Screw the council. You, brats. Makarov sniffed. Let's go find that lawyer and lynch him. Makarov's eyes bugged out. Natsu, we will do no such thing. Right sorry, I meant to say the new council. That's even worse. Makarov yelled, stretching his arm out and smacking the dragon slayer. Anyway, Goku said, grinning as the fairies started to argue about what they should do to the council. I still need to buy some stuff, so about that loan. Makarov sobered immediately, of course I shall give you however much you require. It is the least I can do, which is why I must do more, he raised his hand to cut off Goku's protest. Shut it. You will accept my reparations, or I will force you to. I will give you the money you require, and there will be absolutely no talk of repayment. Also, until every last dime of that money has been paid off to you, you shall eat for free within this hall. He finished grandly standing on the counter, his arms outstretched and his head staring grandly towards the sky. His piece said, he turned back to look at the young warrior. Goku had gone still, staring at the man as if he were a stranger. Makarov felt a bead of sweat forming on his brow. Was, was that not enough? Then Goku's form blurred and he vanished from sight. Makarov whipped his head around wildly trying to find where the speedster went, only for him to reappear seated at a table just a few feet away with a pile of food nearly as tall as Elfman. You, just promised to provide Goku with millions of jewels worth of food. Warren pointed out. Normally that would just be a lifetime supply, but... This is Goku. Makarov sighed. As long as the martial artist stuck around, 
this debt would ensure that the guild pantries were always empty. It would take quite a lot of effort to pay for all that food, Makarov might need to actually do some missions himself to pay for it. But, if that's what it took to right his wrong, so be it. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Since Myra is going to stop working the bar so much so she can run missions with Elfman, I got you a new bartender. Makarov looked up and gave the woman a once-over. A new bartender, huh? I suppose we could use some more help, and a recommendation from one of the biggest eaters in the building can't hurt. So, I only have two questions for you. Can you make a good stiff drink? Launch smirked at the challenge and hopped over the bar. She sauntered over to where the liquors were stored, grabbed a couple of bottles, pulled out a few glasses, and a few moments later handed over a tray filled with various concoctions for her potential employer to inspect. Makarov downed them all one by one with an ever-growing grin. Not bad at all, young lady. He laughed after the last one disappeared down his throat. Not bad at all. You get a pass there. Now then, for the second requirement, you are standing in the stomping grounds of the rowdiest bunch of idiots this world has ever seen. How well can you defend yourself and manage others? Launce grin stretched to the point of mania as she slipped her hand into her cleavage. Oh, don't worry about little old me gramps, anyone give me trouble. Er? Uh? Makarov said, distracted as the blondie groped around inside her shirt. Then, in one, smooth motion, somehow managed to pull a pair of rocket launchers out of her shirt. I've always got a couple of bazookas on my chest. She said. Oh, I like her. Kana laughed from down the bar. Makarov's eyes went crossed as he stared at the gun in his face, he nodded thoughtfully. You're hired. S and DS 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 and SS and DS and DS and DS and DS and D. Gray was starting to get suspicious. No, scratch that, he'd passed suspicious days ago, now he was borderline freaking out. Something was wrong with Urza. Very wrong. This realization had first started to creep up on him a few weeks back, after she'd killed a group of bandits. Urza hadn't gotten in trouble for it. After all, tensions and stress were still at an all-time high in Magnolia, and criminals only made the situation worse. As long as the problem had been dealt with, nobody was about to put up a fuss about the method. He'd overheard Master Makarov questioning her about her actions, half the guild had eavesdropped on that particular conversation, and the swordswoman had offered several perfectly reasonable explanations. But still, he'd known Urza for just shy of a decade, she didn't take lives if it could be avoided. Maybe it was just paranoia from recent events, but he'd felt the need to investigate, so he'd gone to the former brigand's base to poke around. It hadn't been hard to find, if only because of the smell. Everything there was sliced to pieces and tinted an ugly shade of brown. It had taken him several minutes to realize that the brown was actually what was left of the bandits. Urza hadn't just killed them, she'd obliterated them. There wasn't any other word for it, it was as though the vagabonds had been put through a giant blender, painting the ground, trees, and boulders in a fine smoothie of gore. It was then, standing in the blood-splattered clearing, that he knew how bad the situation was. He'd watched Urza more closely after that and been disturbed by what he saw. She barely talked with anyone, the only times he ever saw her in the guild were when she was eating, or retrieving a new mission request, of which the amount she'd completed was staggering, even for her. As far as Grey knew, her largest interaction with her fellow fairies since Magnolia's destruction was when Natsu jostled her while she was eating, for which she literally backhanded him across the room. The others, who hadn't watched it happen, had dismissed it as business as usual. But, she hadn't said a word to Natsu about it, hadn't even looked at him before she struck. What if it had been Romeo? or one of the weaker mags. Urza was a lot of things, imperious, powerful, neurotic, scary as hell, the list went on and on, but one thing she wasn't, was vicious. He'd wanted to tell someone, but who? Goku had left almost immediately after Flute's defeat. Master Makarov had his hands more than full dealing with the council, the townspeople's fears, and an almost literal mountain of other crap. 
Kana was busy keeping Lucy from going off the deep end. He'd gotten so desperate, he'd even tried to confide in the flame brain. That had been stupid. The idiot had thought he was trying to prank him into fighting Urza. Which left, basically nobody he thought would believe him. Urza wasn't around enough for anyone who didn't know her well to notice something wrong, so he was on his own. So, when he saw her hand in her fifth mission completed mission request in three days, ignore Goku's request for help, and then immediately leave on yet another job, he felt he had no choice but to follow her alone. He kept his distance at first, but after a while he realized he needn't have bothered. Urza never looked back or to the sides, her head seemed locked forwards as she marched through the reconstructed town. It was like watching a machine. Urza's current mission was apparently a local one. A pack of forest Vulcan had moved into the outskirts of town and taken to preying on the shipments of resources, kidnapping women, etc. When she reached a cave, the pack of giant monkeys had come out to meet her, leering at her with toothy grins. Urza hadn't said a word, merely raised her hand, and suddenly bits of monkey mincemeat were everywhere as a hurricane of swords blew through the clearing. Gray felt his jaw go slack as the swordswoman pointed, directing the blades into the cave. There were several quick squeals of pain and then it was over. It had happened so fast Gray Haddon had a chance to hide himself before Urza turned about and locked eyes with him. Enjoy the show, she asked. Her voice was so cold, the ice mage had to suppress the urge to shiver. Urza. He swallowed, suddenly regretting that he'd come here alone. You have been following me. It wasn't an accusation, just a statement. Gray said nothing. Urza crossed her arms, I'm feeling generous today. So, you have ten seconds to explain why yourself before I beat you within an inch of your life for your idiocy. Gray stared at her in disbelief. Where were the angry accusations? The righteous reprimands. Urza's threats were serious things meant to chastise. But that one had sounded, bored. Like the thought of beating a friend to a pulp was no more than an irritation. Urza's eyes narrowed. My patience is wearing thin, grey. There was a flash of light and suddenly she was holding a sword, its edge gleaming with a wicked promise. That settled it. Who are you, he demanded, and what have you done with Urza? His friend, no, the thing wearing her body stared at him. Excuse me, she sneered, I offer you a chance to explain yourself, and you give me jokes, scarlet hair waved as she it shook its head. How foolish. Gray sunk into a battle stance, placing one fist against his open palm. That wasn't a joke. You are not Urza. Is that so? The thing tilted its head to one side, and how exactly have you come to that conclusion? Cut the crap. Gray snarled, flecks of ice forming on his hands as he gathered his magic. I can tell from the way you're looking at me. Are you one of Flute's demons? I thought all of you got sent home when Lucy messed up that bullshit portal of yours. I'm not possessed, Gray. The thing rolled its eyes. I assure you, I am Urza. I have merely been empowered. Is it not said that power changes people? Not like this, he needed to get out of here, whatever was wearing Urza's body clearly had full control of her powers. Hell, it seemed to have even more control if how casually she murder is those monkeys was anything to go by. He needed to book it back to the guild and fetch Makarov. He just needed an opening before he could beat that retreat. Gray summoned even more of his magic, more than he'd ever had before. He knew he was going to need it. When the fake Urza opened her mouth to reply, he acted. Not bothering with incantations, he fired off a single icicle straight at its face then turned tail and fled. He'd barely made it half a step before she was on him, a blunt force striking him in the back like a cannonball and sending him to the ground. A gauntleted hand clamped down on the back of his neck. I can ignore idiocy. Urza's voice was calm, like the lifeless center of an iceberg. He struggled to turn his head, 
his face grinding into the dirt. But not insolence, her other hand rose, the sword catching the light. Gotcha. He'd hit the ground with his hands at his sides, palms up. In a rush, he let all his magic out in one explosive burst. The weight on his back disappeared as the temperature plummeted. Gray scrambled to his feet, only sparing on quick glance behind him as he broke into a run. Urza's body was still in the same position, trapped motionless inside the new glacier that towered over the trees. As his gaze landed on her face, her eyes moved, rolling up to meet his from beneath the ice. Gray ran faster. This time he made it a dozen paces before the air split with the sound of cracking ice. He took one more step before he felt himself plucked off his feet and smashed into a tree. How pointless! Gray's head swam. He was pretty sure he'd heard something that wasn't wood-breaking. The ice maid shook his head in a futile attempt to clear his fading vision. Woozily, he stared up at the shiny blob that was probably about to kill him. The blob raised a long, narrower blob over its head. Any last words? I know Urza's in there, said Gray. Oh? Yeah, you punched me. Gray felt himself grinning, even as pain rocked his body. You're holding a sword and still, you punched me. Twice. Urza's still in there. So, you're, not going to kill me. Gray coughed, spitting up some blood. Is that so? Urza, Gray coughed. Won't let you. I am Urza. And I. Wanna bang. Natsu. Gray sneered. His eyelids grew heavy, and Gray mustered up the last of his energy to spit in the blob's face. The last thing he saw before everything went dark was a flash of orange. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
and shuddered violently, as what felt like liquid lightning burned its way through his veins. Oh damn! What the hell was that? The ice mage shouted, before looking up. He immediately scrambled over towards Goku's side the instant he saw Urza's cold face, a terrified gleam in his eyes. Goku, that's not Urza. She's possessed or something, we need to get her back to the guild. Goku glanced over at his scared friend for a moment before his gaze settled back on Urza. Nah, you head back, Grey. Tell everyone what's going on if you want. Urza and I are talking right now though. I'll see you later, okay? Grey looked between the two for a long moment. I'll help then. The two of us should dash Goku cut him off. I barely gave you any energy, Grey. Just enough to wake you up. If you start using magic right now, you're going to pass out again. Just head back, you'll get in the way if you stay here. But dash. Grey? Goku looked him in the eye. Go? I got this. Grey held. His gaze for a moment, then nodded. Right? I'm still bringing back the cavalry though. He pointed a finger in Goku's face. But I expect you to have fixed this whole mess by the time they get here, got it? You got it, Goku said calmly. Grey nodded at the martial artist and took off back towards the guild. Urza watched him go, a contemplative expression on her face. I'm not sure I've punished him enough for his attack against me. Such things should not be allowed without consequence. But, I suppose that I can postpone his punishment in favor of your own. Urza's eyes narrowed. Now release me. Goku let go. You can try to punish me if you want. He said, not backing down. But first, I want an explanation. I think you owe me that much. Owe oh, you. Urza cocked her head to the side, considering him, as though he were an interesting bug she'd found in her garden. Yes, she nodded. I suppose that is true. It is because of you that seeking this power became necessary. Because of me. Goku raised an eyebrow. Yes. You opened my eyes to my own weakness. You and Flute, both. I have often been called one of the guild's strongest shields, its mightiest defender. Yet. I was among the first to fall to the demon. Then, when I returned to battle, aided with a technique that you showed me and in a body not my own, still I proved worthless. You may as well have taken my title away, you proved yourself a far better shield than I have been. Wait, is this about pride? Goku blurted, staring at Urza in disbelief. When have you ever cared for titles? Do not interrupt me, Urza hissed. This has nothing to do with you. It is about me not being strong enough. I was overcome and turned against my allies. Urza shook her head in disgust. An unforgivable failure. So, I turned to the Titania, the fairy who freed me from the demon's power. She offered me the power of the Fae. She tested me and I almost failed yet again, due to my inability to let go of my need to depend on others. But Titania would not let me refuse. She forced her way past all my inhibitions, and granted me a taste of what I had to gain. You mean she didn't give you a choice, Goku's voice hardened. Urza, she's trying to control you by preying on your weaknesses giving you what you want. She's messing with your head. Can't you see how she's changing you? Of course I do. You do. Goku blinked. I do not expect you to know what it is like, Urza's voice took on a hard edge. You, Sun Goku, have never known what is like to walk with doubt. Everything you do, you do with utter confidence. You do not pursue strength because you wish to protect others, or that you fear what will happen if you are not strong enough. You pursue strength simply because you feel like it. Goku's eyes narrowed. I thought this wasn't about me. It isn't. Urza rolled her eyes. It is still very much about me. That is the whole point of this. You know my story. 
Years of imprisonment, years of guilt and worrying, I never felt like I was worth anything more than my skills as a warrior. That is why I was drawn to the guild, where strength earns titles, admiration, and a home. It vindicated me. And yet, part of me never left that cell. My doubts and fear of failure chained me to my weakness. But that is the true gift Titania has given me. I no longer care about that, about what others think about or depend on me for. For the first time in my life, I have complete confidence in my own abilities, a sense of self-worth. Goku was quiet for a long moment. Whenever someone tries to take a shortcut to gain power, the price is always higher than the boost. You've lost your identity Urza, and you never even got full say in whether or not you wanted to keep it. Oh? Urza raised an eyebrow, and just like that, she changed. Her stance loosened, her face becoming softer, as her eyes lost their icy edge. Furthermore, the alien energy that had tainted her magic vanished. Goku furrowed his brow and focused his KI, but try as he might he could sense no trace of Titania's magic. It was just. Urza. She gave me a taste of the power by force, that is true. Urza said, glancing away. But that was just a sample. After the first day, she took it back and returned me to myself. Then she once again offered the me choice to take it or leave it. Now that I understood just what was being offered, I took it. She stared hard at him. I am not possessed, Goku. I took this power because I chose it. Goku met her gaze for a minute, thinking it over. At last, he spoke. Nope. Excuse me. I said nope, Goku repeated. I'm sorry you feel this way Urza, really, I do. But I care about you and I'm not going to let you do this to yourself. He sunk into a combat stance. Urza sighed. I figured you were going to say something like that. But this is my choice, and therefore. Her eyes grew hard and Goku's head began to tingle, as he felt the fey magic creeping back into Urza's. You do. Not get a say. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and the two were forced apart from the resulting explosion. Goku his momentum in the air to spin around, firing another pair of KI blasts after the first. Again, Urza's armor changed, this time a burst of flames heralding the arrival of the Fire Empress. A dome of fire erupted around her, consuming Goku's attacks and barreling on towards him. Goku saw the attack and screamed, unleashing a Kiai that scattered the wall of flame. Even as her attack was blown away, Urza was switching forms again. The purgatory armor entered the battle in a flash of pitch black light, and Urza swung its massive club downward in a titanic overhand swing. Goku made no move to block and for a moment Urza felt a flash of triumph, but as it reached Goku's, head it passed straight through his body without any resistance whatsoever. His form wavered for a moment before flicking out of existence. After image technique. Urza muttered to herself. She began to turn in a slow circle, scanning for any sign of where Goku had gone. A sudden thud had her whirling around, only to see Goku's weighted boots laying on the ground. A moment later, his weighted shirt smacked her in the back of the head, knocking her off balance just in time for a blur to fly in and deck her across the chin. She was sent tumbling directly into the path of a blow to the spine, to a punch to the sternum, to a kick to the side, a knee to the groin, and a foot straight to the nose. Urza flew backwards with a stream of blood flying from her face. Goku reappeared standing over her, his arms crossed and his body tense. As always, Urza huffed, landing on her feet and wiping away the blood. You're stronger than when we last saw each other. I never stop training, Goku agreed. But you're not any stronger at all. You say this fairy magic stuff is gonna make you so powerful, so why aren't you using it? Titania's gift extends beyond her magic. I'm still not convinced I'm going to need it. Urza's magic flared up again, filling the air with a crimson glow. Goku nodded slightly at the sudden surge of magic pressure. Not bad. He commented, probing it with his senses. So, the fairy lady gave you a boost to your natural reserves. His eyes hardened. Was it worth giving up your humanity? How would you know? Urza said coldly, you aren't human. Like that's the same. Goku snorted. I may not know what I am, but I've chosen to be human. You've chosen to give it away. Requip. This time, Urza reappeared in the cheetah patterned flight armor with a pair of short swords. Goku ducked out of the way of a swing towards his neck and kicked out with his right foot towards the girl's exposed stomach. Urza deflected the kick with her knee, using Goku's attack to spin herself around even as she ditched her blades in favor of the spear from the lighting empress armor. As the electrified blade went straight towards his eye, Goku encased his hands in a thick KI glove. He caught the sparking blade between his palms and then twisted it so that he could step in around the weapon and throw and chop towards. Urza's neck. She was forced to let go of the spear with one of her hands to deflect the attack, giving Goku an opportunity to kick out at her other and send the weapon bouncing away along the ground. It had only gone two feet when the spear suddenly stopped in midair, reoriented itself towards Goku, and launched itself towards him like a javelin. Goku barely saw the attack coming in time and tried to spin out of the way. A shallow gash across his side bled slightly down his shirt, but he ignored it as he rolled out of the way as the weapon came around for a second pass. The third time he blasted it away with a bolt of KI and it spun back over towards Urza, who had now returned to her base armor, and pulled out the weapons from both the Flame Empress and Sea Empress armors to wield in each hand. She held the two in front of her and lightly touched their tips together. As they made contact, the metal was engulfed in a mixture of red and blue light. Then the lightning spear came around from above and touched down atop the two weapons, adding yellow light into the mix. That's new. Goku mumbled, the amount of magical energy in the attack was staggering. Taking that head on probably wouldn't be a good idea. As the three weapons were thrust forward and a spiraling beam of fire, lightning, and water tore through the air towards him. 
Goku gathered his KI, braced himself, and sidestepped the blast right before it reached him. Goku glanced back at the wide swathe of destruction the attack had left in its wake, that was still leaving in its wake, as it shot into the distance. He looked back at his friend, despite the amount of magical energy she was throwing around she wasn't even breathing hard. But still. Is that it? Just a lot of raw power. Goku shook his head. You're not this sloppy, Urza. Stop messing around. Urza's eyes narrowed, I will if you do. Goku frowned. You're the one with something to prove. I'm not gonna wasting my energy if you're not gonna take this seriously. Show me what's so great about this that you'd turn your back on your friends. I was taking it slow for your sake. I know how you dislike fights that end too quickly. She tilted her head to the side. Are you so certain you wish to skip to the end? For my sake. Goku echoed. I thought you said you'd stopped caring about others. You're giving off some real mixed signals here. Urza rolled her eyes, you oversimplify it. I no longer care if others respect me or not, but I am fully capable of offering others my respect. I have long acknowledged your skills, as you should be well aware. And Grey wasn't worthy. Is that what you're saying? He attacked me without provocation. Others may think or say whatever they like about me, but should they move from words to action? That I will not accept. Goku stared hard at his erstwhile friend, trying to figure out how much of her was still in there. In the end, he shook his head. Whatever, I'm no good at this whole debating thing. Get ready Urza, I'm going to come at you with everything I have. Urza grinned, her eyes glittering like daggers in the night. Very well then, allow me to show you, the power of a true fairy queen. Music selection, Kill La Kill, Satsuki Kiryuan theme. Urza's skin was suddenly alight in a rainbow of colors. The metal of the heart kreutz began to rattle, shrieking like a chain-bound ghost. The metal began to crumple and boil as rust spread across its surface. Then, with a final wail it collapsed, crumpling to the ground in a withered husk of its former glory. In its place was a simple brown tunic that fell down to the middle of Urza's thighs. No symbol, no marking, no identifying trait of any kind, just fabric. Urza's hair slowly shrank back into her head until she was left with a pixie cut that then grew several shades lighter. Her pupil turned metallic green, expanding to cover the whites of her eyes and her cheekbones rose, giving her a more regal appearance. Most striking though, was that the rainbow of lights across her body condensed onto her back until they erupted out of her shoulder blades in the form of a set of massive, opalescent dragonfly wings. Urza stretched out her limbs, reveling in the magic pouring off her. Well then, Goku. Is my new power up to your standard? Will you finally show me your full potential? Well, you do feel a lot stronger. Goku admitted. You could probably handle Flute Lucy fairly easily. As you could have, Urza scoffed, if you hadn't held back out of your sense of compassion. Goku opened his mouth, closed it, and shook his head. We gonna do this or what? We are, Urza nodded. I've just finished laying spreading the seeds of life. What dash Goku cut himself off, as his KI sense sent off alarm bells in his head. He backstepped just in time, as a bamboo shoot shot out of the ground between his feet, nearly impaling him, as it shot to full size. The moment his foot touched the ground a second stalk erupted. Beneath him, breaking his skin slightly before he had a chance to harden his KI. He let the stalk carry him upwards, balancing on it as dozens more burst from the ground. Beneath him, Urza met his gaze with a savage grin and flicked her hand towards him, the stalks twisted as they grew aiming themselves at Goku like an angry flock of bees. Goku threw himself backwards swinging from the branches and throwing himself around the stalks to keep ahead of the murderous plants. Then the air filed with a sonorous thrum of beating wings, and suddenly Urza had him by the throat. Laughing wildly, she flew straight down,
Goku thrust in front of her to meet the bamboo stalks grew up hungrily to meet him. No time to break the vice grip she had on him, Goku reacted on instinct. K.A.I.O. Ken. A wave of red power incinerated all of the incoming trees and sent Urza tumbling away through the air. Goku didn't give her a chance to recover, instead he launched himself after her, firing a barrage of K.I. as he closed the distance. But the bamboo responded to its mistress' plight, with some stalks twisting around her waist to stop her momentum, while the rest moved to stab at Goku once again. Rather than trying to muscle through, Goku thrust his K.I. beneath him and rocketed upwards into the air. He flew up above the tree line and paused. She's gotten fast, Goku murmured, keeping his ears peeled for the beat of wings, but she's not using weapons anymore. You should broaden your definition of weapon, said a voice behind him. Goku spun launching a K.I. blast at, a flower? The martial artist frowned. Then the flower shot towards him, its flimsy petals turning thick and sharp as they twisted to try to take a bite out of him. Goku annihilated it with a K.I. blast. My arsenal has only expanded. Goku looked down, Urza was beneath him, grinning as more of those flowers floating around her. Look around you, Goku. Urza spread her arms out wide, gesturing at the tangle of trees around her. The power of the Fae connects me to all of this, it empowers me. This forest isn't just my army, it's my army. So, you're saying I should get rid of the forest, then? Green eyes narrowed at him. If you think that's a good idea, go ahead. Goku let the Kaio Ken drop away. This technique was already far too strenuous to risk combining with his multiplier ability. He abandoned his connection to his K.I. and instead drew upon his life force. His hands came together to form the shape of a triangle that he aimed down at his best friend. The view jumped forwards once, then twice so that he could see the anger in her eyes as she tried to fly up to reach him before he could launch his attack. Shin, Kikoho The triangle of energy concentrated between Goku's hands changed into a square and pushed straight down, the life energy giving it far more destructive power than any of Goku's normal KI abilities. He could feel his heart skip a beat with the blast and his power wavered, but that was nothing compared to the devastation that he rained downwards. Urza screamed in agony as the Kikoho slammed into her, flattening the transformed mage and her forest straight to the ground. Even when it hit the soil the attack kept digging, pushing through the ground all the way until she hit bedrock. Goku landed beside her with a slight wince. That attack, that was not a move that he could use lightly. At the very least she looked worse off, her tunic had been almost completely annihilated, leaving mere scraps that couldn't hope to protect her modesty. Her wings looked shredded, and burns were visible all across her torso. But still, she pulled herself back up to her feet and met Goku eye to eye, completely uncaring about her figure on display. Come on Urza, that's enough isn't it? You're at your limit. I don't want to have to hurt you anymore. Goku said slowly. Urza grinned, her white teeth a stark contrast to her dirted face. That is fine. Because, my armor is ready, she stamped her foot and Goku leapt back as the ground around them began to churn. Huge slabs of black stone surrounded Urza, sliding up her body in clumps until she was completely encased from head to toe. Humans burn coal for fuel. Her was muffled from behind the stone, but that's so narrow-minded, don't you think? Theirs is even an old wives' tale, a false one, that it can be compressed down through sufficient heat and pressure into a diamond. But, applying my armor magic on top of the Titania's nature magic, I can turn that tall tale into truth. The massive mound of coal turned cheery red and began to shrink down and melt around her form. A horned helmet, a turquoise breastplate, and a full-body suit that left none of the skin exposed that Urza's normal armors did. Her wings shot out of the suit matching its color, glistening with renewed light, and even her eyes seemed to be glowing blue from within her helm. This is the ultimate armor, the Diamond Queen suit. I appreciate your aid in 
testing out its limits. Are you ready? Goku responded with a single KI sphere straight towards Urza's chest. The attack hit head on and bounced harmlessly off to the side of the side. Goku followed up by rushing in to punch Urza across the jaw. Her face moved all of a centimeter, and his knuckles throbbed from the attempt. Then with a single swing of her arm, she sent him bouncing across the crater. Goku rebound back to his feet almost immediately and charged back in, launching a flying spin kick to the side of Urza's neck. Again, his attack bounced away harmlessly, and he was forced to dodge out of the way of another backhand. Urza knelt down and punched her fist straight into the ground, pulling out yet another mound of coal. A flash of red, a compression of matter, and a glowing blue, double-edged diamond sword was gleaming menacingly for Goku's blood. Right, K-A-I-O Ken. Urza grinned as her opponent was engulfed in the bright red aura once again. She blocked his first strike with the flat of her blade, and when he vanished from a slight in a burst of speed, rather than try to track him she merely allowed him to strike her wherever he please. Each and every strike failed to so much as scoff her armor's shine, and after several moments of waiting she felt out a pattern well enough to reach out and grab him by the collar. Goku's momentum slammed to a stop, and Urza shifted her grip to Goku's right arm. With a simple twist she yanked his shoulder out of its socket, and then punted him out of the crater. She followed him with her wings beating lazily, as she drifted through the air, and landed beside him, as he tried to climb back onto his feet. If that's it, I'm going to be disappointed. Goku said nothing, awkwardly leaping away, as his balance was ruined by his right arm hanging uselessly at his side. With a bitter howl he reached out with his left arm and snapped the right back into place before cupping his hands together. K-A-I-O Ken times two. K-A, me, ha, me, ha. The blue beam shot forwards and Urza thrust out her hand, as though to catch it. But right before the beam hit, it scattered apart into dozens of glowing blue KI spheres that surrounded her from every angle. Goku locked eyes with her and grit his teeth. Hell's own Kamehameha. Each and every one of the dozens of tiny KI spheres fired themselves as an individual Kamehameha waves and consumed Urza in a gigantic ball of blue explosions. Goku leapt backwards as the blast radius of his own attack annihilated the ground where he had been standing. He skidded backwards into the destroyed section of the forest and began to look around. I need to stop blowing up the scenery. If I destroy a whole forest, Makarov is gonna be so pissed. He said as he let his aura fall away. Oh, don't worry. I can solve that for you. A voice whispered in his ear. A green pulse of energy spread out across the ruined forest, everywhere except for the square where Goku had blown away the soil. Suddenly, trees of all types sprung up from the ground, completely restoring the forest to its natural form with the exception of the tree that Urza had shoved Goku's head straight through. It seems that neither your strength nor your power is a match for this form. Now do you see why taking this was the right choice? Urza said, her voice fully of a sinister playfulness Goku pointed his hand at the sound of her voice and let out a blast of energy to knock her away. He yanked his head out of the tree and spun only to see her bearing down on him with the diamond sword once more. Goku ducked underneath her blade and rolled away, but she pressed the attack, a well-aimed stab piercing his shoulder. He pulled away from the follow-up swing and dropped prone to avoid a stab towards his hip. Urza stomped down towards his head, and Goku fired off a KI blast that propelled him straight towards her other leg, knocking her to the ground. He scrambled back up to his feet, ducked another swing, and thrust his hands up with his fingers splayed out in front of his face. Solar flare. Urza cursed as a blinding white light burned her retinas. Her blade clattered to the ground as she poured futility at her eyes. For ten seconds she was blinded before spots began to reappear in her eyes, and she could look around the forest once more. Goku had vanished. With a scowl Urza retrieved her blade and began to walk through the woods. Hiding now. Urza called out. Really? 
Reveal yourself, Goku, these guerrilla tactics are beneath you. Silence echoed through the trees. Scowling in annoyance, Urza stretched out her senses to tap into trees around her, using them to track any disturbances, hunting for Goku's essence. It took her half a second to find it, and she took a vicious pleasure at his startled yelp when the tree he was hiding behind twisted and tried to strangle him. Urza grinned to herself and strolled over, taking note of the crimson aura that once again lit up the horizon. When she arrived, Goku was standing over a pile of demolished trees, breathing heavily and with shallow cuts from branches now even more prominently spread out across his skin. And there is yet another difference in our powers. Every single usage of yours saps your strength and taxes your endurance. Your strongest attack takes great amounts of time to charge, and your abilities to enhance yourself kill you while you do so. I, on the other hand, merely have to use my magic to maintain this armor. The trees and the rest of nature are at my beck and call simply due to what I am. The longer this battle grows, the worse your chances become. So this fairy thing really is strong. Goku huffed. So what? I'm still not giving up until you snap out of it. Urza sighed. Get it through that thick skull of yours, Goku. I am not possessed. I am not mind controlled. There is nothing wrong with me. Goku didn't say anything, he merely held up his fist and tensed. Urza could feel the air crackle as his power began to rise. Urza grinned, she knew what was coming. Ha! Huh. Goku's power erupted in a white vortex, with flecks of gold sparkling throughout it. Urza's grin widened in vicious glee. This was it. The true test of her new might. She gripped her sword tighter, and rallied her own power. The spiraling power surrounding Goku began to shrink, compressing down into his left hand. Urza could swear that reptilian eyes were visible from within the glowing golden attack. Higher! Goku roared as he leapt straight up into the air. He thrust his fist over his head and vanished in a pillar of golden light. Claws, scales, and then a massive draconic head emerged from the pillar, revealing a yellow copy of Shenron. The dragon echoed Goku's roar, reverberating through the forest. Urza wet her lips at the sight and screamed out her own challenge, her sword held high. Come. Prove my power. Dragon feeiest. The dragon's maw opened wide, and it rushed downwards to meet the red head's blade head-on. Everything vanished in a golden blue wave. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
or if he was too dazed from trauma and blood loose to form a sentence. He was dying. Urza's head throbbed and she dropped Goku to the ground and stumbled backwards, grabbing uselessly at her skull. Her hair slowly began to grow back out to its usual length, and the color bleed out of her eyes to leave behind their normal brown color. The pain from her head eventually faded, leaving behind a pit in her stomach. Goku. Gray was rallying the fairies to rush towards the forest when Urza burst through the doors, carrying her injured friend over her shoulders. More than a dozen fairies armed themselves at the sight of the two blood-covered teens, but any hostility died the moment they saw Urza's guilt-ridden eyes and heard her pathetic cry of help. Goku spent an entire week in the infirmary recovering. He chatted happily with all of his visitors, and for several days he shared a bed right alongside Grey. Boredom took only until the third day to set in, and then there was a rotation of people whose job it was to keep him from wandering off and potentially aggravating his wounds. Natsu chatted with him about Juvia constantly dosing him to keep his flames under control. Kana came in with Lucy and talked quietly with him about the blonde's recovery and how much she had improved since her spirits had taken her to visit them in the spirit world. Gajil challenged him to a fight when he was better, with his two tag. Along smocking their leader in the background for not having the courage to do so when Goku was fully healthy. Happy even stopped by with a fish. But the restlessness grew, and he couldn't be watched at all hours throughout the day. On day nine in the infirmary, Goku flew out the window to track down the person that he actually wanted to talk to. To his senses, her aura had shifted back to its normal form, with only a few traces of the fairy magic left behind in her. He found her in the forest, staring down into the square hole that he had blasted in the ground with his kokoho. Urza glanced up as he approached and gave a slight nod as he landed beside her. Hello, Goku. Urza greeted, her tone neutral. Urza. Go nodded back. I'm sorry. Her voice lowered to barely above a whisper. I was drunk on the power and went too far. I may have noticed that. Goku acknowledged, tapping his stomach where she had impaled him. But, as long as you've snapped out of it, I forgive you. Urza tensed, bowing her head. That may be a problem. Goku furrowed his brow. What do you mean? Music selection kill la kill ragyo kiryuin theme, Blumenkranz. It means she is not done wielding the power of the Fey, son Goku. Goku went still as the cold voice filled his senses. As he watched, the air before them seemed to distort as a tiny robed figure materialized in midair. Goku stared for a moment as he tried to place the presence, when he did he glared. You must be Titania. He said coldly. Indeed. I am going to give you one chance to leave. Goku held up his hand and made a ball of ki. Considering how well you fared against one touched by my power, are you sure you have any grounds to be making such ultimatums? Goku, stop. Urza met his gaze. He stared back for a few moments before, reluctantly, letting go of his ki. Urza turned back to face the floating figure. As for you, leave. I will speak for myself. Is that any way to talk to your benefactor, Urza Scarlet? You are no friend of mine. Nor am I your enemy. I merely granted you power and the proper attitude to match it, free of inhibitions. Anything you did with either is of your own accord. Which is how you know that when I tell you to leave, it is because I mean it. HMMPH. The fairy's lips curled into a smile. I see I was correct. You shall make a magnificent fay. Leave? Urza repeated. There was a pop in the air, and Titania was gone. Urza sighed, her body relaxing slightly, but not completely. She turned her head slightly in Goku's direction. 
If you wish to rescind your forgiveness, I understand. Now? Nah? Urza blinked. What? The martial artist stuck his hands behind his head. The reason I wanted you to stop this was because I thought you were being controlled. But if that was true, you would have left me to die. You didn't, so I know that still you in there, he shrugged. As long as you think you can control this. Urza looked at him, her eyes going soft. I understand that the power is changing me, Goku. She said quietly. Truly, I do. Meh, I'm not that worried, you're still Urza. But you better apologize to Grey. I shall. Urza said at once. I have no desire to harm those I call my friends. Oh? So you do still care about them? Goku raised a brow. Of course, I do. It is only when I directly access the power of the Fae that such feelings are muted. I've been using it for the past few weeks non-stop, so the effects may have grown a little intense. That's an understatement. Goku snorted. But still, do you really want this? I do. Urza answered immediately. If I am to protect those I care about, I must grow stronger, no matter how. Her hands tightened into fists. I just need to learn to control it. That's all right then. Goku said, stepping forward and sitting down at the edge of the square hole in the ground. I'm the last one who would judge someone for wanting to get stronger, and I know you'll get the hang of it. Besides, if you go nuts again, I'll be there to smack you out of it. Urza stared at him, then snorted. Please, you wouldn't be able to stop me. Maybe not. But next time, you better believe I'll be ready. Goku grinned, just you wait, next time we meet I'm going to blow through that armor like it was nothing. Urza scoffed and looked away. So, what now? Hmm, well, I still need to find a spot to build my new house. Well, I was thinking that this might be a good spot for you to start. Urza said, pointing at the hole in the front of them. You already have a hole ready made in the ground for a basement. That's not a bad idea, it might be a bit bigger than I was planning, but I'm sure that I can figure out what to do with a bit of extra space. Goku replied. Also, would it be alright if I assisted you? I feel as though I should. That sounds great. Goku grinned at her, just the thought of it was getting him pumped up. He slung an arm around her shoulder. Let's do it. Let's build a home together, Urza. Urza went still, her face going red. But she didn't resist. Instead, she placed her head against his shoulder. Yes, she said quietly, let's get started. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
It isn't great, in fact it is probably something like AC at best, but like I said, it was my very first attempt at doing something along these lines. And I did not, but in the damn effort for it to get deleted and sent off to my trash bin. So here it is for your reading enjoyment. Chapter 46, Goku and Urza the Hoaman 45 Ending Grey was rallying the fairies to rush towards the forest when Urza burst through the doors, carrying her injured friend over her shoulders. More than a dozen fairies armed themselves at the sight of the two blood-covered teens, but any hostility died the moment they saw Urza's guilt-ridden eyes and heard her pathetic cry of help. Goku spent an entire week in the infirmary recovering. He chatted happily with all of his visitors, and for several days he shared a bed right alongside Grey. Boredom took only until the third day to set in, and then there was a rotation of people whose job it was to keep him from wandering off and potentially aggravating his wounds. Natsu chatted with him about Juvia constantly dosing him to keep his flames under control. Kana came in with Lucy and talked quietly with him about the blonde's recovery and how much she had improved since her spirits had taken her to visit them in the spirit world. Gajil challenged him to a fight when he was better with his two tag along smocking their leader in the background for not having the courage to do so when Goku was fully healthy. Happy even stopped by with a fish. But the restlessness grew, and he couldn't be watched at all hours throughout the day. On day nine in the infirmary, Goku flew out the window to track down the person that he actually wanted to talk to. To his senses, her aura had shifted back to its normal form, with only a few traces of the fairy magic left behind in her. He found her in the forest, staring down into the square hole that he had blasted in the ground with his kokoho. Urza glanced up as he approached and gave a slight nod as he landed beside her. I was thinking that this might be a good spot for your new house you were planning on building. You already have a hole ready made in the ground for a basement. Urza said mildly. That's not a bad idea. It might be a bit bigger than I was planning, but I'm sure that I can figure out what to do with a bit of extra space. Goku replied. It turns out that you couldn't have beaten me out of it. Her voice lowered to barely above a whisper. The magic was directly tied to my emotions, the only thing that could have brought me back was a rush of emotions strong enough to completely overcome that deadening and self-centeredness that was forced upon me. If anything, your victory would likely have only served to cement in the resentment even further in. Ha, huh, guess it's a good thing that you beat me then isn't it? Yes. Same deal as the last time we had a fight though, I don't want you feeling all guilty and beating yourself up about it. I believe the situation is slightly different here, and yet I still predicted that you would say something along those lines. I figured that a better use of my time would be to help you begin planning for construction. Urza pulled a few stacks of blue paper from her pocket, each one with a different building design scribbled atop it. I asked Levi to find me the books that you were using the other day, and I browsed through them for an idea of what you might find appealing. Wow, thanks Urza. That's going to help out a lot. Also, I would be willing to help you with construction, if you would still have me course. I definitely need the help. We can start as soon as I officially get discharged from the hospital. He said cheerfully. Urza sighed. Of course you snuck out. She said tiredly. I had to make sure you weren't all depressed and beating yourself up. Thank you. Yep. And you shouldn't worry about thinking that you forced me to join Fairy Tale. You and I both know that you are far happier out training in the woods than you are in the guild hall with the others. Yeah, but if you didn't bring me here that is all I would have done until someone else eventually found me. Who knows how that might have turned out. Or even worse, I might have just stayed up there for my whole life. Just think of all of the good fights that I would have missed. Hmm. I just worry sometimes. I know I've never said as much to you before, but when we were younger and I had just escaped the tower, you were a large part of why I managed to keep from shutting down and shoving everyone else away from me. You were so nice and you had no idea how social interaction worked, 
you wouldn't have even noticed if I tried to isolate myself. It seems to me that I am getting more out of this than you are, that I might be taking advantage of you. Really? I didn't even know I was doing anything like that. That's good that I was able to help you though. Goku said. Urza shook her head and stared off into the distance. You realized that we are both damaged, yes? Goku blinked and looked down to examine their bodies. Well, I'm still a bit beat up, but it looks like you've healed up pretty good. That's not what I meant. I'm talking about our mentalities. So that brain damage that Paula Yusuka told me I got as a baby. And the trust issues and emotional damage that I gained as a child. Neither of us process things the same as our peers, and our emotional ranges are stunted. So? Doesn't really mean all that much in the long run, does it? We just do what we do as we are. Goku said simply. Are you aware of a bet pool about the two of us within the guild? You mean that one about who would win between me, you, and Laxus? I think we just proved who'd win that. That's not what I, wait, what about Laxus? What about Laxus? I beat him up real quick, and then you beat me up when I was trying even harder. No, I was talking about the pool regarding our relationship. Like friend relationship, or like Biska and Alzac. The second. Ha, huh, do we have that kind of relationship? Ha, huh, I think you would be aware if we did. But, have you ever thought of anything like that? Not really, no. I thought so. I hadn't either for a very long time myself. But Myra Jane pulled me aside before you left to find the Dragon Balls, and she talked with me a bit about our time fused. She felt my emotions, and unlike me she was capable of fully understanding how I feel. So, despite not having thought of this kind of thing before, would you be willing to try? The slight waver at the end of Urza's question was barely noticeable, but it was enough to catch Goku's attention. He thought for a moment before responding. Like I said, I never really thought about anything like that before. But of everyone I know, if I did try something like that it would probably have to be with you. Urza smiled lightly and pulled her friend into a tight hug. For the first time in over a month, she felt truly content. I understand that the power is changing me, Goku. Truly, I do. She looked back at him, but people change. They change because they want to. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Each one dug into the ground several meters before coming to a stop, all perfectly even with one another. The young teen smiled and turned over towards Goku. All right, the support beams are all set. You can start pouring now. Goku nodded in reply and started to lean forwards, tipping the giant container on his back so that it began to pour into the hole left over from his battle with Urza. The cement sloshed to the ground, and with the aid of more gravity magic it began to even itself out and climb up the walls. In just a handful of minutes, the basement to his future home had been all set up. All right, that went pretty well. Goku said. I think we can move on to training for the day. Good. Kagura said with a smile. I was hoping that we could work on some more swordsmanship today. A, hey, I don't think I'm going to be much help with that. You're better off tracking down Urza if you want to work on that. Kagura's face fell slightly. Are you sure that's a good idea? She said. Grey told me that she still has that titania power inside of her. I don't know if it would be safe fighting her like that, even if it is just for practice. I don't know either. Goku admitted. I still don't understand this power, or how it works. I met that weird fairy lady that gave it to her, and she doesn't seem like a good person. I trust Urza, and I don't think she would intentionally hurt us but I don't know how long it takes to mess with her head or anything like that. I don't know if I would feel safe trying to train with her now. She might have it perfectly under control now, she probably does in fact if Makarov is correct in his assessment. But, I saw you in the aftermath of that death match. she looked at him levelly. It wasn't a pretty sight. If she lost control around me, I would not be capable of stopping her. I don't know about it being a death match, not on my end at least. I mean, I used a lot of my stronger moves, but I wasn't ever trying to kill her that whole time. Goku said. It might have made a difference. But I didn't think that would be an issue. Urza and I wouldn't want to do anything like that to each other. Goku flashed a confident grin, but the swordswoman wasn't having it. It only takes one to turn a battle into a fight to the death, she replied quietly. Yeah. I think Urza knows that too. She's been wanting to hang out all the time lately, any time we aren't doing anything important. I think she's trying to make things up to me. She got me a bunch of flowers and a box of chocolates the other day. He frowned, the chocolates had been good tasty, but what was he supposed to do with flowers? He'd gotten the impression that Urza hadn't really been known either, but she'd been really insistent that he take them. I already forgave her though, so I'm not really sure why she's so insistent. Goku pondered. But any time I say I want to train, she knows to leave me alone. But, I thought you two enjoyed training with one another. Kagura asked. Yeah, and that's part of why I lost. Urza knows pretty much all of my moves, and she knows my limits. I was only a little bit tougher than she expected, but she had an entirely new skill set to use on me. I had to invent a brand new move variation mid-fight just to try and catch her off guard. So, now I'm going to be doing a lot more training by myself. That way we both have a disadvantage. That's a sound plan. I, I hope you surpass her again. I think Urza is a good person, but I do not like this power she has chosen to wield. Yeah, Levi, Kana, and Grey have all said something similar to me lately. And Natsu has been sparring with Juvia, well, I say spar, but it's more like he attacks her and she drowns him a little bit, but he's been doing it a lot lately to try and close the gap. But anyways, enough talking. It's training time. I think we've been working on manipulating K.I. enough that it's time to get you an actual attack. Goku said, grinning. This time, Kagura matched it. Things were awkward for Urza at the guild. 
With construction around the city finally coming to completion, the mags of Fairy Tale were frequently their headquarters far more often than before. Yet, they still managed to avoid her without issue. Not a single person went out of their way to engage her in any sort of conversation, and whenever she tried to talk to someone, those nearby grouped together, giving her wary looks. She couldn't blame them. Losing control like she had, and then still deciding to keep the power that twisted her mind, people were concerned and justly so. Two people had nearly died, and no apology was going to fix that. Right now, the only thing she could really do was just prove to everyone else that she wasn't dangerous, and that she could control the fey inside of her. Easier said than done. At the very least, the villagers were unaware of what she had done. She could walk through down helping the general population as much as she wanted, and Makarov was still willing to sit down and have a conversation with her. Nobody was actively hostile with her, and still at least made attempts to be cordial, except for Launch. Urza was pretty sure she had seen Launch spit in her food. She couldn't even find it in herself to get too mad. As Goku and Kagura trained the day away in the woods, Urza made her way down to a recently reopened blacksmith, so that she could pick up an order that was now a month overdue. Thank you for the assistance, Mitch. She said as she went out the door, bag in hand. Why a kid, no issue. But the next time some crazy swarm of demonic watsits invade the town, try to get me some of their parts, yeah. I really wish I had a chance to try and make some new stuff out of those little bastards. I shall keep that in mind. She said, backing away awkwardly, before turning and marching out the door. Once she was sure she was out of sight, she opened the bag and examined her order. She nodded approvingly. Mitch was a strange one, to be sure. But there was no denying he did good work. The redhead marched through the city, exchanging short greetings with the townspeople who noticed her, and offering help to whoever she saw working. Walking from one end of the city to the other took over eight hours of her time as she lifted lumber, hammered boards, and helped to distract children as their parents worked. It was good to help people with their problems even when she did not have to. It helped reaffirm her sense of self. Or did seeking that self-gratification make her altruism ultimately self-centered in nature? Did it matter? She wasn't sure and didn't like to think about it. By the time she entered the woods, the sky was tinged with pink. Urza reached out with her senses, tapping into just a trickle of the fey magic, and reached out with her mind to the trees. Feeling the life energy curling up through every last plant around her, the small animals that darted around amongst the leaves. She could sense everything. The tiny implosions of trees turning sunlight into matter, the hum of the dragonfly's wings as it skimmed across a pond, the death throes of a mouse as a fox pounced upon it. It was dangerous, beautiful, and, oddly, peaceful. Like her tiny worries and problems ultimately didn't matter, and should not matter. It was nice. Her sense of peace was annihilated as a shaky blue beam punched through the trees and glanced off of her shoulder. Urza stumbled to the side in shock and glanced around, trying to peer through the tree line. The clearing where Goku had decided to live was just up ahead. No hostiles. There were only two people standing on the grass up ahead, and they matched the weight, foot size, and stance of Goku and Kagura. A frown on her face, Goku marched out to meet them. Hey Urza. Goku called over his shoulder before she even managed to breach the tree line. Goku. You need to be more careful with your attacks, that blast of yours nearly caught me. Goku opened his mouth to comply, but then he glanced at Kagura and shut it again. Instead of a response, he shrugged. Sorry about that. It's all right. But was that a new variation of the attack again? It seemed rather wobbly and unstable. Nah, nothing new yet. I was just working on a control exercise with Kagura. I see. Urza said before turning to the young teen. Is your training going well then? I believe so. 
My abilities to wield KI appear to have grown, and my connection to Archenemy is stabilizing. I have become far stronger than I was when I first arrived. That is good to hear. Urza replied. She looked back and forth between the two for a moment, then glanced behind them at their progress at Goku's home. It was far further along than she would have guessed, and she hadn't even had an opportunity to help out yet. Ah, Urza. Was there something you needed? Goku asked, snapping her out of her inner thoughts. The knight realized with a blush that she had just been standing there, staring at the two for at least a minute without saying anything. Ah? Urza muttered. Sorry. Urza's hand dropped to the pouch hanging off her hip, but then she hesitated. If she returned to the guild tonight she could just expect more of the same and it was still too early for her to even start considering turning in for the night. Have you two eaten yet? I am planning on going to eat beside Simon tonight, thank you. Kagura said. Nobody can tell me why he isn't awake yet. Paula Yusuka said that he is over a month overdue now. She won't say anything, but I think she is starting to worry that he won't wake up. I am going to walk over there now, thank you for the lesson. Kagura nodded in Goku's direction before she set off at a brisk pace across the forest. I've been visiting Simon myself at least once every three days. Urza said after a moment. She is not alone in her fear for his chances of waking up. His life force is still getting stronger still, so I'm not really worried about it. I'd say that he should be back up and moving in another day or two. That shouldn't you have told her? That probably would have made her feel a lot better. I did. She said that I wasn't a doctor, and that she couldn't afford to get her hope up. Then she said she didn't want to talk about it anymore, and we beat each other up for an hour and a half. It was a really good warm-up. You made an emotionally distraught girl feel better by beating her up for 90 minutes. And it actually worked. She was looking a lot better afterwards, so I guess. If Natsu or Grey had tried something like that I would have smacked them for being so insensitive. But it worked. Goku said in confusion. Urza just sighed. Yes, yes it did. She agreed, changing the subject. What's your dinner plans? I was just going to go down to the guild hall again. Free food all the time is awesome. Would you be interested in something different tonight? The bakery that I frequent just reopened two days ago, and I have yet to have an opportunity to visit. Ah, oh, I guess so. I don't know if that kind of place sells enough food at once for me, but it all tastes pretty good. I'll just go get a second dinner latter on. A wide smile spread across Urza's face. At last. It's been far, Far too long since I've gotten to eat any of that sweet strawberry shortcake. Come. Urza's hand closed like a steel trap around his wrist, and suddenly Goku found himself being dragged back towards the city at such speed that he was practically a kite flying behind her. When the red head came to an abrupt stop at the shop's door, Goku slammed into her back and bounced to the ground. Urza didn't notice already talking to the person behind the counter to get her precious dessert. Huh? Goku said looking down at his throbbing red wrist and his dislocated shoulder. So that's what that's like. After snapping his arm back into place, Goku walked in and ordered a couple dozen meat-filled pastries. He began wolfing them down with both hands, a single bit apiece, while Urza eyed her giant cake with a manic look in her eyes. Hello sweet deliciousness. She breathed. I have missed you. She raised her silverware to the sky and brought it down with the finality of a dinner bell. It took the pair about five minutes to gross out the other patrons enough that they had the place to themselves. The servers reluctantly made their way over to the table three more times within twenty minutes of their arrival to resupply the pair as they devoured everything. So, Goku said through a mouthful of food, good. Yes. Urza moaned back past a mound of strawberry. Good. In the background, 
the waiters huddled together, staring at the two in disbelief. I've never seen the red-haired one eat like this before. One whispered. She was in here every single day before the demon attack. It's like she's trying to make up for the mist cake all at once. The second replied softly. What about that guy in the orange? He's eaten five times as much, and his half of the table looks like a splash zone. One of us is going to have to clean that up. Said the third. As head waiter, I delegate that to the rookie. The first quickly said. The fourth sighed and went into the back to try and find some latex gloves. Ah cheer up new guy, at least now we don't have to do a whole lot of work. The second chuckled softly. Yeah, but we aren't getting any tips either. The fourth complained. What are you talking about? This is a bakery, not a restaurant. Tips are voluntary, not compulsory. The third chipped in. What? Two words, new guy. The first said with a smile. Second job. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Goku said after a while. Grandpa taught me the staff as a supplemental skill, despite how useful it is he always wanted me to work on my hand-to-hand -hand a lot more. The pole helped with reach when I was small, and it let me move around a lot quicker when I didn't have my KI under control, but I think that I've grown past it. It was great to use something from my grandfather, but now I think it's time for me to hang it up before it becomes a crutch. Oh? Urza blinked. That's an interesting way to look at it. I'm going to put it right next to the four-star ball. I didn't think I'd ever see it ever again. Thanks, Urza. Really? You're welcome. When the message came through from the council, Makarov recalled every single mage who wasn't already tied down with another job. Thankfully, he had expected them to pull something like this, so he had managed to keep most of his powerhouses within the area. Even Laxas and his crew were in attendance. Once everyone was inside, Makarov decided to get things rolling. All right, brats, put on your big boy pants and listen up. Makarov roared over the crowd. The council has sent us a few requests to start trying to make up for everything that happened around here. Basically, these are mandatory missions that we can't afford to screw up if we don't want those blowhards to try and mess with us even more than they really are. So, I'm going to read these off one at a time, and I want you to volunteer only if you think that you are fully qualified for the job. I'm going to tell you straight up, if I don't think you are right for it, I'm going to slap a veto on you. First off though, Gajil. The Iron Dragon Slayer snapped his attention onto the old man, and off of the large steak on his plate. What? Got something interesting for me. The metal man ground out. I already told you what I want you doing, did you pick a team yet? Makarov asked. Gajil's gaze turned predatory and slid over to the two sitting beside him. Sue and Bose both blanched at the sudden attention and paled slightly at the intensity of the look their longtime boss was giving them. Can I, uh, Get a rain check on that. Bose asked. I really need to wash my hair. He finished lamely, fully aware of everyone's eyes riveted on his shiny, perfectly shaved head. Whatever, take them and go. Makarov yelled. And remember, there is to be absolutely no wanton destruction. The world demands better of us, and we need to pretend that we can actually deliver. Gajil rolled his eyes and yanked his comrades onto their feet and out the door. Makarov nodded to himself and then opened up the envelope containing the various mission papers. Yanking out one at random, he was about to read the information out loud, but then stopped when he actually noticed what it was. Shadow Gear, this one goes to you. Makarov said before tossing the scroll towards. Lever's head. Both of her comrades leapt up to block the projectile from their beloved leader and managed to slam their heads together hard enough that they both fell backwards onto the floor. Levi ignored their antics as she neatly caught the folded paper in her palm and began to peruse its contents. So all we have to do is sort through all the magical information the council lost track of when the previous group was killed. Yes, Makarov said before a sly grin split across his face. Of course, you will have access to other information too, such as a blackout that saw the resurrection of several Magnolian citizens, as well as some prison guard down south. There may or may not be an investigation going on right now trying to link fairy tale to said blackout, but we all know how terrible the council is at their paperwork. Hear you loud and clear. Levi said before she scooped up her team and made her way out the door. Next, huh? Natsu, I think we might have an excuse to get you doing missions again a bit early. Ah uh, yeah. Natsu crowed. It's about time I got to get back in action. What do you need me to do? Eat? A? Eh? Some fire elementals have caused a massive forest fire out west. 
I want you to head out over there, eat up all the fire, and then eat the elementals. I mean, if you want to pay me to eat I'm all over it. Natsu said with a grin. Good. Now, in addition to Natsu, I want three volunteers to go with him in case of any trouble. Kana's hand shot up while her other hand forced Luce's into the air next to her own. Gray brought his own hand up as well, and the instant she saw that Juvia joined in as well. Kana, Lucy, and Gray should work just fine. Juvia, I believe that the next mission is more suited for your talents. But, but. Juvia mumbled, as she watched Team Natsu, or more specifically Gray, walk out the door. She deflated. Now, this one is probably the most important of the various tasks. Makarov said, his expression growing serious. One of the most active dark guilds, Aration Cease, has apparent become enough of a threat that the Council has requested a multi-guild alliance to track them down and eliminate them. Along with Fairy Tail, there will be three other guilds joining forces with our own. I have spoken to the other masters involved already about what type of mags to send. Kate Shelter is sending along someone who they claim to be the best healer of the next generation, and Blue Pegasus is sending their magical bomber, as well as someone to fly it. That leaves Lamia Scale and Fairy Tail to send in the fighters. So, boys and girls, who wants to go to war? The hand of every last fighter left in the building shot up into the air. Ha ha. I figured as much you little brats. But I want all of you to keep in mind, the opponents that you will be fighting are likely all going to be at the low range of S rank at the very minimum. If you can't handle that kind of combat, then you might want to sit this one out. Many of the normal fighters still kept their hands up, more than willing to take the risk. Makarov narrowed his eyes, and the air around them seemed to become heavy, like someone was squeezing the entire guild between their hands. Many hands began to drop as the mags struggled simply to stand. And in the center of the wave stood Laxus. Come on, he snorted, rolling his eyes. You want to fight, but can't stand up to this. He shook his head. If you can't handle this, then plant your butts and get out of the way of the real fighters. Then a mug of beer flew through the air and beamed him in the back of the head. Laxus spun around and was greeted with the sight of a demon. So, this kind of power then, Laxus. Myra Jane smirked as she stretched out her Satan soul form. The girl tilted her head and poked at her lip with her finger in mock concern. You know, it looks like you might have gotten some beer on that nice jacket. I really hope that doesn't stain. You? Laxus growled, his eye twitching. What's your problem? Problem? I have no idea what you're talking about. Myra Jane said innocently. I mean, there is no possible way that I'm still carrying a grudge for when you tried to blackmail me into making one of my best friends strip down for you so that you would act like any other decent human being would have by coming to help us fight a battle that threatened the lives of each and every other person in this room, right? That would be extremely petty and vindictive of me. Her lips curled further. One might even say, demonic. Several mags staggered away, as a black aura crept its way around her body. Hey! I'm not building another one of these damn things, so if you two want to fight, then do it outside. Makarov roared. Laxus, Myra Jane, both of you are on this mission. Shared combat teaches friendship or something. Learn to get along. He looked at his grandson, staring at him somewhat sadly. Laxus, I'm not going to address those allegations. Myra just made towards you, he said gruffly. However, if she chooses to take you to task about it herself, then that's none of my business. He turned away. Juvia, the rain mage was still staring forlornly at the door where Grey had left, she hadn't even seemed to notice the magical pressure he was exerting on the room. You're going too. The rain woman didn't react. Makarov blinked and tried a different tactic. The faster you deal with the Dark Guild, the faster you can go see Grey again. Juvia's head snapped around, 
her eyes suddenly reminding him uncomfortably of the darkest depths of the sea. Really, she asked slowly, her voice creaking like a ship that's mast was about to break. Ah, yeah. Makarov. I, ah, uh, bet he'll be really impressed if you help take down one of the strongest dark guilds in existence, too. Juvia will do it, she declared, turning away, muttering to herself. Makarov was fairly sure he caught the words hold them, and the bubble stop, but chose to ignore it. As long as she was pointed at people who could be objectively considered the bad guys, it was probably fine. Then, with a sense of reluctance, Makarov glanced over at his last two S-class mags in attendances. Goku, you're going just because I don't think there's a single other job involving combat and search and destroy anywhere in this lot. The fighter nodded in understanding and Makarov turned to the last fairy still standing. Urza. Makarov let out a long sigh. Master, Urza nodded calmly waiting his words. Do you believe that you are in control of yourself well enough to complete this mission? He asked. Of course, Master. Urza said, her voice ringing with complete confidence. Nothing like that shall ever happen again. It better not. Makarov said before he looked out at all of his assembled team. If she loses control again, I want all four of you to beat her down and drag her back here, so we can sort things out with the Titania thing once and for all. I understand the desire to acquire power to defend those who are important to you. But, well, you know how I feel about those who would become unwilling threats to my children. He glanced meaningfully at Goku, or more accurately, his waist, where the martial artist's tail wrapped around it like a belt. Based on the way Urza's eyes widened, he could tell she understood his meaning. Urza said nothing more, but after a long moment, she nodded. Good. Then you lot get moving, I doubt this is going to be an easy mission for you. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Ha! Huh. After being around happy for so long I was expecting other talking cats to be a lot nicer. Goku said thoughtfully. Happy isn't always nice. Urza cut in. He is just nice to you because of how much fish you feed him all the time. You've never had to deal with him when he has something to tease you with. Really? Goku frowned. I never thought of it that way. Wendy, these people are clearly simpletons. Carla sniffed. I find myself rethinking the wisdom of this whole endeavor. What a judgmental cat. A voice said from the door. A new trio of people entered behind Wendy. The first two were familiar to Goku and Urza, a white-haired mage in a blue and yellow jacket, and a pink-haired girl with her hair up in pigtails and wearing a dress that matched her hair. The final was a stranger though. He was bald with strange slanted eyebrows and a long beard down his chin. I believe I remember you, aren't you that ice mage who was rivals with Grey? Urza said, nodding to the silver-haired man. Lion, wasn't it? Leon. And yes, the man bowed his head. His eyes swept the room. Grey isn't here. A pity. I was looking forward to seeing how he had grown, and Sherry wanted to reintroduce herself to that woman she fought on Galuna. He ignored his friend's growl and turned. But as far as introductions go, let me introduce you to Lamia Scales Ace, Wizard Saint Jura. The bald man bent down into a bow and raised his head to Goku directly in his face. A wizard saint. Goku repeated, his eyes glittering. Do you have the strength to back up that title? It was more of a rhetorical question, Goku could feel the magical power emanating from the man. I like to believe I do, Jura said slowly. Though I am the newest to the title, I earned it fairly. Might I ask you your name? Son Goku. He held out his hand. Jura took it and Goku gave it a hard squeeze. Jura raised an eyebrow and squeezed back. Goku's grin widened even as he felt the bones in his hand creak under the force. Any chance you'd be willing to have a spa after this? Son Goku, I do believe I have heard of you. Jura nodded politely. And I would be honored to share a spa with you, as long as you can make it worth my while. There was no taunting in his tone, simply earnest confidence. Count on it, the martial artist grinned, then looked away a loud humming filled the air. That must be the blue Pegasus bomber. Urza commented, shall we go out and greet them? Together, they all filed outdoors to greet their ally. Goku wasn't sure what to expect from the word bomber. It looked like a giant metal horse floating in the sky as it gently lowered into the clearing before the mansion. It looked cool, sure, but he couldn't really sense much power coming from it. Who do you think they sent to pilot it? Goku asked, as the ship touched down light as a feather. I don't really know many people from Blue Pegasus. I know, a couple. Urza said, her face twisting in a grimace. I can only hope they didn't send someone, strange. A hatch opened up on the side of the ship, unfolding into a set of stairs, and a single, short and stoutly figure sashayed out. Everyone stared. What? Carla whispered, her words twisted with disgust and horror, is that? Master Bob. Urza blinked. The rather fat man grinned. Urza darling, he waved, prancing towards with his arms held straight down, and his palms turned out at a right angle. It's so wonderful to see you again. You look lovelier than ever. Anne, is that? The balding head turned and bright red lips pursed in thought. Oh my, he put a hand to his cheek. Goku. Is that you? I haven't seen you since you were no taller than my waist. Dear me, but you've become quite the handsome, strapping young man. Oh, thanks. Goku grinned uncertainly, and the man spun away to introduce himself to the others. Goku had some vague memory of meeting this man years ago, the maroon tank top was definitely familiar, but he was pretty sure he'd been more focused on food at the time and couldn't remember much else. 
I am surprised that Master Bob came himself, Urza murmured beside him. He's not giving off a lot of magical energy. Goku whispered back. Watching as the man reached up and pinched Lax's cheek and gave Myra a hug. Neither does Master Makarov, until he wants to. Urza chided. Do not misunderstand me, Goku. Master has told me of the days Bob and he fought together. According to him, Bob was strong enough back then to give even him a run for his money, and when he first became a wizard saint, the council had trouble deciding which of them to award the title to. Makarov said the only reason it went to him without contest was because Bob didn't want it. Really? Goku raised an eyebrow, intrigued. Maybe he'd have to ask the older man for a spa too. After they dealt with the Dark Guild, of course. Well this has simply been a delight. Bob chirped, clapping his hands and skipping to the front of the group. To be surrounded by so many lovely ladies and darling men, he sighed happily, even as half of them took an uncertain step back. But alas, business calls. I do believe with my arrival, everyone is accounted for. Is everyone aware of the plan? We find these orations cease people, and anyone working for them, and beat them up right. Goku asked. How manly. Bob gushed and yes, that is the nature of our mission here. We've got quite a few naughty people to punish, so we'd best get started. So, the man clasped his hands behind his back and swayed from side to side, somehow managing to look demure. Who would like to take a ride on my beautiful stallion? He asked, tipping his head back toward the ship. Everyone stared at him. I shall carry, Wendy. Carla declared before the girl could say anything. I can fly, said Myra blurted out. As can I. Urza said, shifting into the Blackwing armor and taking off before anyone could react. I have Sherry and myself covered, Leon answered clapping his hands together and summoning a giant ice owl. The pink-haired woman practically threw herself onto the bird, lack of warm clothes notwithstanding, and the two took off after Urza. I'm good, said Goku with far less panic in his voice. Juvia, you want me to lend you Nimbus? Juvia believes she would. The brunette said gratefully, as she edged away from the old man. Bob pouted and turned to the last two mags. I would be honored, Master Bob. Jura said, walking to the ship without hesitation. Bob's smile reignited and he turned to Laxus. The Thunder Maid's eye twitched and his head turned to Goku. For a moment, Goku thought Laxus was going to ask if he would be willing to carry him again. But after a long moment, pride won out and Laxus walked stiffly past the portly guild master and onto the ship pointedly ignoring Myra's not-so-muffled snickers. Well I believe that accounts for everyone. Bob cheered. And so, the hunt was on. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Enjoy my words like the solid gold pieces of nugget Y hilarity that they are. Oh make, make it rain. S and DS 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 and D. Juuuvvr, the yell that echoed around the town was accompanied by a barrage of knocks on the door that threatened to break it off its hinges. Yo, Juves, Bows called from the couch. I think there's someone at the door for you. Really? Sue said, staring at him with wide eyes. Do you really think so? Juvia. Open this damn door, or I'll burn it down. I need to talk to you. MMMM. Yeah, pretty sure. Bose nodded. Call it a gut instinct. Juvia sighed, putting down her whisk and wiping her fingers on her apron. Honestly, how was she supposed to craft the perfect wedding cake for Gray and herself with all these distractions going on? She marched over to the door and pulled it open, then took a quick step back to avoid a familiar, pink haired, pyromaniac as he tried to pummel the door that wasn't there and fell forward. He cursed as he tilted his head back to look up at her. Salamander. Juvia said neutrally and, a little more warmly, hello happy. Hi Juvia, the cat waved, beaming up at her from Natsu's back. Juvia. Natsu repeated, pushing his way to his feet. I got something we gotta discuss. Juvia is busy, she answered tersely. Unless you have set a building on fire, she politely requests that you go away. She made to shut the door, but Natsu slammed his hand against it. Now wait just a damn minute. Natsu yelled. I came here to ask you for help. By nearly beating down our door. Sue scoffed. Kick the bum out, Juju. Juvia pursed her lips. It would be a rather expedient solution. Oh, come on. At least hear me out. Natsu growled. Juvia pinched the bridge of her nose and sighed. She'd had to babysit the dragon slayer quite often recently. He is loud and violent, and nowhere near as manly or charming as her darling Grey. But he was also stubborn as Gajil, it had to be the lizard in them, and she knew he'd just come if she didn't at least hear him out. Besides, she could always throw him far out to sea later, and give Happy a fish not to fly him back. Very well, she sighed, pushing him out the door and following close behind him. She crossed her arms. What do you want from Juvia? All right, here's the thing, Natsu leaned closer. I need you to help me get stronger. Excuse, Juvia. I'm serious. Natsu snapped. Everyone's getting stronger. Myra, Lucy, Levi, you, hell, even Happy got a boost from those demon things. He said jabbing a thumb at the cat perched on his head who nodded and flexed his tiny arms. As for Goku and Urza, he shook his head, they're leaving me so far behind that it's not even funny. I gotta train ten times harder than ever if I want to catch up. But everyone is stupid busy with this rebuilding the town and mission stuff. And Juvia is not busy, she deadpanned. Ah, yeah. Natsu nodded. Aren't you just fawning over squinty eyes, he gagged. How is that busy? Juvia recoiled. How dare he? So anyway. Why do you say? You wanna fight me or what? No. Juvia does not, she sniffed. She has important matters to deal with. If you want to train, go try to boil the ocean. She turned to stomp back to her task. Hey. Come on. Natsu grabbed her shoulder. She turned back ready to half drown him. Wait just a second, both of you. Happy alighted on Natsu's wrist, holding out a paw towards both of them. Natsu, the cat said, glancing back at his friend. Leave this to me. Ah, uh, okay. Natsu let go. Happy turned back. Juvia, he purred. 
my fellow blue-haired buddy. Please forgive Natsu for being rude. The feline lowered his voice to a stage whisper. He's stupid. What? Natsu roared. Very stupid. Happy repeated gravely. But luckily, he continued, his voice lighting and a smile lighting up his face. He's got me. And I'm not stupid. The cat reached around his back and pulled off his tiny backpack. I wouldn't expect you to help Natsu for free. After all, you're a busy woman. Now, I have no jewels for you, but I do happen to be in possession of certain items. That I think might appeal to you, he reached a paw into the bag and began to rummage around. Juvia raised an eyebrow, uncertain where this was going. You see, the cat explained. Well, I'll let my work speak for itself. He pulled out a white square of thick paper and held it out to Juvia. She took it and examined it. It was a photograph, she turned it over. And felt her heart freeze. The photo depicted a boy. A boy with familiar, dreamy black hair. It was grey. The fot had to be a few years old, as the man of her dream looked a quite a bit younger than he did now, he couldn't be older than ten here. His eyes were closed in slumber, he was sprawled out on the floor of what had to be the old guild hall, his head propped up on his arm, and he was wearing a bright blue onesie with dark snowflake patterns stitched into the fabric. The, the cute. Juvia. Juvia could not. She could feel her heart melting in her chest as her breathing came out in heavy gasps. Yuvia. Juvia, she blinked her way back to the world around her as Happy tapped her face. Well, he grinned a grin that would not have looked out of place on a certain cat with pink and purple stripes. What do you think? Do you like my merchandise? I if Juvia fight Salamander, she can have this, she stammered, unable to keep the desire out of her voice. Oh, you can have that one right now. No fighting needed. Happy nodded. But if you don't help Natsu, I won't let you have. He paused. The others. There, there are more. Many more, Happy nodded, shaking his backpack at her lightly. I've lived in the guild all my life, and nobody remembers that I own a camera. I have seen many things. He purred, waggling his eyebrows at her. So, do we have a deal? Juvia stared at him, at the photo, and at last at Natsu. All Juvia needs to do is beat up Salamander until he can't move anymore. I? Juvia will do it. Hell yeah. Natsu pumped his fist into the air. So, when do you want to start? Juvia said nothing, her eyes glazing over. Ah? Uh, Juvia? It was then that Natsu detected a deep rumbling. The sound of loud rushing water, accompanied by screams of fright and horror. His brow furrowed and he looked away. In the distance, he could see something reaching up towards the horizon, from the direction of the sea. It took a few moments for him to realize he was looking at a wall of water. A colossal wave reaching towards the sky and threatening to blot out the sun. A wave that was drawing closer by the moment. Slowly he turned back. Juvia, he asked weakly. Happy, who had alighted on the water maid's shoulder waved at him cheerfully. You're welcome, Natsu, the cat beamed. The wave broke, and the dragon slayer knew no more. Chapter 48, The Underwhelming Six Part 2, Keenzained Master Bob disturbs Juvia. The waterbender muttered as she soared through the sky on Nimbus. Beneath her, the flying cloud buzzed in something that sounded like agreement, inching away from the bomber and ending up closer to Carla and Wendy. Oh, ah. Uh. Hello. Wendy stammered, waving awkwardly. Carla gave the blue-haired mage a suspicious look, but made no comment. Juvia says hello. The older woman responded, eyeing Wendy and her companion curiously. How did you meet a flying cat? Happy has always told Juvia that he is the only one around. Oh, Carla and I have been best friends since I was tiny. Wendy said, 
some of the nervousness leaving her eyes. I found this really big egg one day and I got really curious what was inside, so I kept it warm and watched over it until she was born. We've been best friends ever since. She's always looking out for me and making sure that eat my fruits and veggies. The young girl beamed up at the cat. Carla raised her head, basking under the praise, yes well, after all that trouble you went through making sure I was safe I could hardly just leave you, could I? You watched over me, so now I watched over you. Carla said with her nose in the air. Wendy giggled, just hard enough to jar Carla's grasp on her slightly. Stop that at once. Carla snapped, I don't want to drop you. Sorry Carla. Wendy said contritely. There is plenty of room on the Nimbus if you wish to join Juvia. Juvia said. Wendy's eyes instantly lit up in excitement. Oh, can we Carla? I've always wanted to ride a cloud before, even when you told me I'd just pass through. But this is a magic cloud, right? Wendy enthused. Carla wrinkled her nose at the cloud. Is it, sanitary? Juvia frowned, feeling Nimbus roiling slightly beneath her. Nimbus is a cloud. She said slowly. Juvia is not sure it could get dirty if it tried. Carla shot the cloud a distrusting glance, but gave in to Wendy's pleading. Wendy landed with a soft poof on the fluffy surface. Satisfied, if not completely happy, Carla disengaged her wings to land beside her. And vanished from sight as she fell straight through. The cat gasped in surprise as she tumbled through the air for a few seconds before she was able to right herself and flew back up level to Wendy and Juvia. What was that? The cat snapped, glaring at the cloud, which somehow managed to radiate innocence. Why did it allow me to fall through? Carla shouted, her veins throbbing as she looked at the little yellow cloud. Oh, don't worry about it too much. That little ball of fluff is just kinda picky about who it'll give a ride to. Myra Jane called down from above. The demoness was a bit closer to the bomber than the rest of her team, being within shouting range of Bob was worth the trade-off of watching Laxus trying to handle being right beside the man. The Thunder Mage was stomping around the ship looking like he was honestly contemplating jumping off. Bob would skip around in his wake, chatting about God knows what. At one point she'd seen the jackass try to distract himself by talking to Jura, who looked perfectly serene, unbothered by the bobness of their host. But the guildmaster had inserted himself into the conversation, draping his arms around their shoulders and smiling. Now, how could she make his day even worse? Myra's gaze slid over to Goku and Urza, who were flying together at the front of the group, and a toothy grin spread over her face. She drifted just close enough to the bomber that she was sure that Laxus could hear. Oh Goku, could you come back here a moment? The demon girl sing-songed. Goku glanced back and cut his speed until he pulled up alongside her. Urza joined a moment later, her eyebrow raised in question. So, we didn't really get a chance to talk about this earlier, but I heard that you and Laxus ended up in a fight for some reason before you tried to save everybody from the demons. She said unnecessarily loudly. She watched out of the corner of her eye as the blonde turned to glare at her and carefully hid her smirk. Urza immediately noticed what was going on and rolled her eyes, but nonetheless made no effort to stop her. Goku was exactly as clueless as Myra had hoped. Oh, yeah he was going on about how the strongest should lead and stuff like that, so I had to beat him up really quick so that he'd listen to me when we were trying to figure out what to do and stuff. That must have been annoying. But at least you were able to take him out pretty easy right? Myra continued. Laxus turned his back on them and actually struck up conversation with Bob, trying to block them out. He had some really cool moves, and his lightning speed thing was awesome. I want to fight him again, at some point later on, when I don't have to rush things to see how he fights more. Goku said excitedly. You'd really have time to study him that closely in the middle of a fight. Myra Jane went on, adding just a tinge of confusion to her performance. 
You'd have to be a lot stronger than him to do that safely, wouldn't you? Ah, I guess. I try to study everyone that I fight, but it's easier if I have an advantage and can slow things down. Goku said right before the lightning bolt struck him from out of the blue. Goku let out a choked cry of pain as he went spiraling towards the ground, smoke trailing behind him. Urza dove after him the moment she realized what happened, scrambling to catch him before he plummeted to the ground. Myra whirled on the bomber, dark magic gathering in her hands. What the hell you nut job? Myra roared. Laxus stared back at her wide-eyed. That wasn't me. He protested, glancing around in an equal mix of confusion and wariness. Myra Jane immediately went from anger to alertness. Laxus wasn't one to not take credit for attacking people. Jura had risen to his feet and was staring over the edge, scanning their surroundings. Beside him, Bob had stopped dancing and was doing the same, bending over the edge with one hand shading his eyes theatrically. Jura suddenly shouted and pointed down, and Mara spun around to witness a blonde man standing atop a cliffside, pointing up at her. She had just enough time to recognize Lax's face before the lightning bolt came flying up at her. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and as it drew nearer the mags could see a cloaked man with spiked brown hair riding atop it. The duplicate Myra Jane, however, did not appear to have the snake's ability. Stop, it cried. I'm the re-dash, its protests were cut off as it dodged a bolt of lightning, only for a glowing blade to pierce her straight through the stomach. Urza winced at the creature's scream of pain. It sounded exactly like Myra. She was certain they had attacked the correct one, but she still found herself glancing at the demoness beside her. Then Goku followed up, hitting the woman in the air directly with a Kamehameha. In a flash her body fell apart, and two dazed-looking spirits were left behind. Gemini, said a deep voice. Urza jumped and stared when she realized it was Bob. The guildmaster's overly friendly smile was gone, veins were budging on his bald head, and he was glaring at the pair of creatures with a look so hard one could have broken diamonds on it. Out of the woods marched a small group of mags, joined by the one atop the snake. Up front, an old man crying a witch doctor's staff and covered in tattoos. On his left, a giant man with long, flowing red hair, with a face that looked like it had been magically flattened, as well as a sleeping boy with dark hair that was being towed along on a flying carpet. To the old man's right, a white-haired woman who appeared to be wearing a swan. The snake man landed beside her with a smirk, balancing on the creature's back and drawing an annoyed look from the final member, a man with spiked blonde hair, googles on his face, and a strange metal contraption around his jaw. The oration cease, I presume. Jura said, stepping forward. Indeed, Jura of the Wizard Saints, the old man said, smiling pleasantly. It is a joy to meet one as distinguished as yourself. I am known as Brain, and I dash. Wait, hold up a second. Goku suddenly shouted as he pulled a couple of small note cards out of his pocket. Sorry, he said, grinning sheepishly as everyone stared at him. It's just, Levi gave me some homework on you guys and I don't want to make her mad. He looked down at the cards. Hmm, okay, I think I got it. He said after a long moment. He pointed at Brain, brandishing one of the cards as he did so. I can feel your power is sealed up for some reason, so that makes you the smart, but stupid leader that sits on his hidden power for so long that it never matters by the time he actually brings it out. Brain's eyes narrowed and he opened his mouth to retort, but Goku cut him off, now pointing at the man on the carpet. His energy is feels really weak, but he's sleeping at the start of a fight, so I'm betting that makes him the powerful, Jimiki one-trick pony. The man completely failed to react besides snorting in his sleep. Goku's hand then turned towards the giant. You're the giant muscle man that's just around to smash stuff. How dare you, the man interrupted. I'll have you know that I am here on behalf of the glorious substance that is money. Oh. Goku blinked, peering at his cards. Well good for you. Okay, I'll get the next one though. Wait, I'll get two at once. He said as he brought up his hand to point to both of the last two male mags in the group. You have a pretty decent power level. He pointed at the snake man. But you're still way too cocky for your current level against all of us. I mean, we've got a wizard saint. He jabbed a thumb at Jura. You probably can't sense energy, but let me tell you, he's on a whole other level. He then turned to the last guy. Your power level is really weak. Aren't you six supposed to be S tier? Anyways, with how cocky you are I'd say you are both gimmick fighters as well, but ones with something just relevant enough to not rely on it as much as the sleeping guy. How's that? Goku asked eagerly. The snake man snorted, grinning slightly. You're a funny guy. The other man frowned at him. Oh, lighten up racer, you should be happy. He came to those conclusions really, fast. The white-haired woman rolled her eyes. I think you've pegged them both quite nicely. She said with a smile. But what about me? Oh, ah. Uh. Goku took a moment to shuffle through his note cards. Let's see, one girl on the team, 
Fancy dress, are you the? Goku squinted, fan service. Everyone stared at him. Myra Jane coughed while the snake man stuffed his knuckle in his mouth to muffle his snickers. Excuse me. The woman said after a long moment. What does that even mean? I'm not totally sure. Goku frowned, looking back and forth from her to the card. He leaned toward Myra. Myra, you're probably a better judge of these things than me, would you describe her as cow-chested? Mira Jane's snort descended into helpless giggles as Cobra bent double, laughing out loud. The enraged woman pulled a glowing golden key from her cleavage. Everyone tensed, sensing that this diversion had come to an end. Well, Brain coughed, attempting to take back control of the situation. He paused, searching for the words as he stared at Goku, then shook his head. Never mind. Racer. If you please. Right, sure. The scrawny man next to the snake guy shrugged and stepped forward, I'm Racer. You're a bunch of morons, his body blurred and suddenly he was standing amongst them, his hand around Wendy's throat. And I'm taking this kid now, so bye. His body blurred again, and all they saw was an afterimage of him taking her off into the trees. Brain turned and took off after them, his staff glowing as he went. The rest of you, deal with them however you see fit. His eyes narrowed. Especially the one with flashcards. Wendy. Carla screamed. As quickly as she could, the cat sprouted her wings and attempted to fly after her friend. Just as the flying cat got clear from the field, a roar began to grow from within the woods. It built in crescendo until hundreds of dark mags were pouring into the clearing. They brought support. Jura declared, his eyes narrowing. I had assumed this was merely an ambush born of them spotting us in the air. But to have their allies already assembled here, he shook his head, sking in disapproval. We have been betrayed, someone told them we were coming. Then everything went to hell. The gathered dark mags let loose a storm of spells, sending fire, lightning. Water, rocks, squiggly arcs of green light, and other, less identifiable, attacks upon the guild mags. Jura slammed his palm into the ground and walls of earth rose around them. The barricade shook under the weight of assault, but held strong. Whichever one of you can get around them the fastest, go after the girl. The wizard saint commanded. Then the walls of stone around them began to melt, exposing them. Jura looked up and saw the block-faced man's eyes grinning at him. His eyes glowed red and the ground began to turn to quicksand before him. Jura stomped his foot, Resolidifying the ground and strode toward the grinning dark mage. Myra Jane took to the air, grinning to herself, when she saw Cobra, and his snake rising up to meet her. Goku and Laxus both charged forwards, red and yellow auras sparking as they ran straight through the horde of dark mags, effortlessly batting them aside, as they went after the fleeing members of the seas. They split up. Goku shouted at the lightning mage, sensing Brain peeling away from Racer and Wendy. I'm going to go try and get Wendy back, track down Brain. Laxus nodded in reply and the two split up after their quarry. As the rest of Jura's barrier crumbled beneath the assault of spells, a wall of swords flashed into existence in their place. They absorbed the last few attacks of the volley, and then the alliance moved. Urza threw herself into the melee, a twister of glowing metal. Out of the corner of her eye she saw owls made of ice dive bombing the hordes of dark mags and trees coming alive in the distance, smashing any mage within reach. Lamia Scale appeared to be in fine form. And on her other side there was a tidal wave that could only be Juvia sweeping through the tree, picking up earth, plants, and mags alike. Urza saw a three trio of green energy bolts arcing up towards Myra. The swordswoman twitched her finger, and an equal number of blades flew out to slice the attack from the sky. Urza nodded in approval even, as she cut down a bulky sword mage that was attempting to chop at her. This was good, her control of her powers was growing ever sharper, and she would use it to defeat her enemies and protect her allies. 
she could do this. Grinning savagely, Urza threw herself at another knot of mags. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Cobra chuckled as he dipped around a couple of punches and then had his snake dive out of the way of an evil explosion. Really, the only thing I truly care about is eventually hearing the voice of my best friend. He said, petting the snake's head. I want to be able to talk with her. Myra Jane frowned, blasting off another few waves of energy and grimacing as she missed again. You joined a major league dark guild so you could talk to a snake. Why didn't you go find a druid or something? They are everywhere, it's one of the most popular magical jobs there is. Everyone wants to hear what the dog is thinking, I bet it wouldn't be hard to find one who could do a snake. Because, ah, uh, Cobra paused, blinking. That is a good question. I'll need to remember that one for later. But as for the Dark Guild. His snake wheeled around Myra's attacks, and he leapt up, slamming his boot into her face. Sending her wheeling away. I really don't like people. He grinned. Tragic childhood, this sick place called the Tower of Heaven, being enslaved and whatnot. He shrugged, you know how it goes. Sometimes, a guy just wants to see others suffer. Oh, the tower. Myra nodded, rolling her eyes. I heard about that. I kind of figured that it wouldn't be coming up again after my friends freed all the slaves and helped blow it to hell. Myra Jane groaned as she lashed out at the man with her claws. Cobra swayed out of the way and opened his mouth wide, two of his teeth were pointed, like serpentine fangs. Poison dragons roar. A twisted black and red beam fired from Cobra's mouth, striking her head on. Myra started choking, her stomach writhing with waves of sickness. Her blood felt like it had been set on fire inside of her body, her brain felt inflamed, and her wings wanted to fall off her body. D-Dragon Slayer. She forced out. Second generation. He said proudly as Myra struggled to stay airborne. Better than the first generation in every possible way, he gestured to her, one hit, and an S-class is down. It speaks for itself. I'd say you have, oh, thirty seconds. Forty, he shrugged. Tough, luck lady. He laughed. Ha 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 ha. Myra laughed right with him, straight through the ache in her lungs. Cobra's laughter cut out immediately. Next form. He said wearily. Mira Jane's laughter cut out as well. Are you some sort of mind reader then? Nah, I just have really good hearing. Your thoughts were loud enough for me to pick up. So, mind reading the cough cough. Myra's sentence was cut off as lungs suddenly revolted, and a blackish goo dribbled out from her lips as she forced something loose. She brought her hand up to her mouth and wiped some of it off onto her fingertip. A look of revulsion slowly bloomed on her face as she looked at the dragon slayer. Yes, that is what I put inside you. He answered her thought. It's poison. What were you expecting, rainbows? So, what was this about a transformation? Urk, I am a lot more powerful than pretty much everyone in my guild. Myra Jane said through gritted teeth. Even the rest of the S class don't know how strong I am. Because most of them, they see Satan's soul, and nothing else. Makarov banned me from using anything higher. Slowly, Mira Jane's voice began to regain strength. A small wisp of blue flame sparked up and curled around her body, rejuvenating her. Satan's soul, Halfers. Blue flames erupted, and Cobra was forced to pull back from Myra's sudden surge in power. Her wings, arms, and legs all turned crystalline. Her wings nearly doubled in size, and as her hair stopped resisting gravity and fell back along her neck, a pair of massive blue horns burst from her skull, KR-15. Cobra stared. Oh? Myra leered at him, it doesn't matter if you were dodging me by reading my mind or by listening to my body. I've burned your poison out, and now all I have to do to beat you is move faster than you can react. Then, Myra and thought as clearly as she could, I'm going to grab you by the face, I'll drive you all the way down from here to the forest floor, and then blast you with my cosmic beam. 
hard enough that you won't be able to get up under your own power until long after the rune knights have taken you into custody. She blurred forwards and Cobra desperately tried to throw himself out of the way. Tried. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The power tried to burn me out from the inside out. Jellal tugged his collar down with one hand, revealing the glowing blue veins of his neck. It nearly killed me, but now the power of that blasted cannon resides within my body. I must say it's been quite an agonizing few months, waiting for the cease to finally find a way to cure me, to undo the damage enough that I could finally return to my own mind. Instead, your alliance happens to bring one of the only people capable of healing me straight to our doorstep. It's sort of ironic, isn't it? No clue, I'd have to ask Levi or someone. So, what's all the seals for? Did someone hide some sort of giant super weapon around here or something? It wasn't really a shot in the dark, he'd never heard any stories about magical seals and ancient forests. That had something nice inside. As a matter of fact, yes. Jellal chuckled. I was just turning it on and locking it down so that you can't turn it off again. In a short while, Nirvana will help to annihilate each and every light guild on this entire continent. Oh, H-A-A-A. Jellal sidestepped the incoming blast without even looking at it. The attack punched straight through the seals, shattering them on impact and sending Jellal into a fit of laughter. And now I don't even need to lock it up. You just destroyed the only chance you had of stopping Nirvana. Jellal rushed in, his fist cocked back to strike Goku right across the face. The next instant he was on the floor, holding his nose. I've gotten stronger since we fought it out last time in the tower. If you just try to fight me at the level that you used back then, you won't even be able to lay a finger on me. Goku stated. Is that so? Jellal eyed him, smirking. Okay then, he said lightly. If that's the case, why don't I give you a taste of just what that you and Urza forced upon me? Jellal's eyes burned bright blue, as the energy coursing through his veins suddenly surged. Lacrima literally exploded out of his body, coating him from head to toe in a thin layer of magical crystals. His hair looked more mineral than organic, and its color changed to a far lighter blue. His muscles popped, doubling or even tripling in size everywhere across his body. Arcs of magical current were actually visible beneath his skin, flaring up each and every time that his body moved. With every breath his magical pressure grew. It was as though his lungs were funneling the cannon's power throughout his body. It was too much for his old body to have ever hoped to contain. Beyond just the growth of his muscles, everything began to expand. His bones grew longer and thinker, filling the air with an ominous crackling as he gained an extra foot, then another over the martial artist. In some places his body couldn't handle the inflation. His elbows and knees cracked and turned jagged under the new weight on the joints, and his ribcage turned into a solid piece of flexible armor. All of the elemental magics flowed within the very being. The ground at his feet started to smolder, as little sparks of flame burst to life around his feet. The air around him grew damp, while it bent and twisted to his command. As his body finally settled, he looked more like some kind of primal titan than anything that had ever been human. Well then, is this more to your preference? The crystallized man sneered. Yeah, that's a little better. Kaioken. Jellal suddenly had to force back the urge to puke from the force of the fist that slammed into his stomach. What what? The man choked. How? Like I said, I'm a lot stronger than I used to be. If I go all out now, I could probably give most of the wizard saints a run for their money. But you? Those lacrima haven't made you any faster or stronger. From I can feel, it might have done the opposite. Your magical power has gone up, but everything else dropped. Your body can't handle the changes, and all of the crystal is slowing you down. Or, in other words, Goku grinned, tapping the giant creature on the nose. You can't hit me. Jello roared and fired off a beam of yellow magic, but Goku dodged to the side long before it could reach him. Don't feel too bad. I'm sure with some training you could figure out how to make this work the way you want it to. Then think how strong you could be once you've mastered it. 
Goku said excitedly. We could have a really good fight once you get out of jail. Jail? Jail? Do you think for one single second, I'm going to sit down and let you throw me into prison? You're dying here, today, and then I'm going to send each and every one of your friends after you. This is the pinnacle of my heavenly body magic. True heavenly body magic, Seema. In moment the moment it took for Jellal to ready his attack, Goku's eyes widened in shock. Physically Jellal was of no concern now, but the magnitude of magic he was wielding compressed into a single blast that could level half the forest and anyone in it. His only option was to make sure it couldn't go off at all. Kienzen. The instant before Jellal's attack could be unleashed, a glow yellow circle sliced clean through his chest and continued onwards, flying off into the distance. For a long moment, the two men stared at each other, locked eyes conveying hatred on one side and determination on the other. Then the moment passed and Jellal collapsed to the ground, shattering into nothing but a pile of useless lacrima. A frown crossed Goku's face before he walked over to check the remains. His entire body was crystal all the way through. Weird. Goku poked at the lacrima with his shoe a bit. I don't see anything that looked like organs or anything, was that actually Jellal? Maybe they made some sort of weird puppet thing. Goku. The fighter turned to see Urza. Swooping in from the sky in her blackwing armor. With the exception of a few strands of hair out of place, she looked completely untouched. What happened? I saw Racer running back towards the group from overhead and thought that something might have happened to you. Then I ran into Wendy and she told me that Jella was here. Urza was desperately trying to keep her cool. She had buried him, there was no possible way that he was back. He didn't have to worry about him again. Even if he was back, she could still beat him, especially now. Right? Urza was gratefully pulled from her inner turmoil when Goku pointed down at the crystals. This thing looked and acted like Jellal a minute ago, but I have no idea if it was actually him or not. Ah, a crystal copy. Urza wondered, taking a calming breath. I guess. Doesn't matter right now though, he activated some sort of magical super weapon before I was able to stop him. Something called Nirvana. We should probably find it and try to blow it up, or something before any of the seas can grab it. I don't think that will be much of an issue. Myra Jane called down as she swooped into land between the two. Some of them are down already, all of their backup is out, and I keep seeing lightning flashes on the horizon. The Lamia scale people are already taking on the other two, so once we figure out where this magical doodad is we can wrap this up. Goku and Urza nodded in agreement and turned to begin the hunt just in time to see the forest begin to shake. What they had assumed to have been ruins suddenly stood up out of the ground on massive mechanical legs, and the entire city rose to its feet. There see, we found it. That wasn't so bad right? Myra Jane asked. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The bartender's voice went from disorder jumble to enthused greeting in three seconds flat, and the former thief was already fishing around behind the counter before the girl had a chance to respond. One takeout dinner, right? She said as she fished out a white plastic bag. You didn't really specify what you wanted this time, but I noticed you really liked the pork roast and the steamed carrots, so I just threw in a bunch of that for you. That sound good. Perfect, thank you. Kagura said as she tried to match the barkeep's smile. I also put in a small cup of broth. Lunch continued. I know that you like to sit with your brother for your meals, and I thought that you might like to try feeding him something different than all of those potions that he constantly has to take. I know that if I was asleep for so long, I would get tired of people constantly feeding me the same thing for so long. There was dust in her eyes. There was nothing wrong, just dust. Thanks again. Kagura murmured as she turned to walk away. Of course. Come back anytime. Just a few months ago, she would never have even considered that her life would change to end like this. She probably would have continued wandering around until she eventually heard about the fall of the tower, but she would never have heard that her brother was still alive. And without him, or anything else to drive her forward, would she have had the strength to keep moving forward. When she spent a decade of her life driving forward towards a single goal, what would have happened when her purposing of living was stripped away? Kagura shivered in a way that had nothing to do with the wind that was blowing through the woods. Simon was alive, this wasn't worth thinking about. It didn't matter that he wasn't awake yet, he would be soon. It didn't matter how much longer it was taking compared to what the healer had said, it didn't matter that she still felt some sort of anomaly in his spine. He would wake up, he would be fine. People woke up from comas, they weren't a guaranteed end. She wouldn't be alone again. Kagura didn't even realize how far she had walked until she was already knocking on Paula Yusika's door. The old woman just waved her in and Kagura took her seat beside Simon. The pink-haired woman had stopped complaining about her constant presence days ago now. She knew that no matter what she did, she wouldn't be able to keep Kagura away. For the moment. Both parties were fine with that. Like every other visit, Kagura ate her meal in silence. She watched over him, took her time to think about what she wanted to say, and tried to imagine how he would respond if he would just wake up. Once her meal was done, Kagura carefully wrapped up her trash and put it on the ground beside her chair. She would need to remember to carry it out with her to throw away in the city if she wanted to avoid the healer's ire. She took a breath to gather herself and then placed her hand on her brother's arm. Everyone left on jobs today, including Goku and Urza. My training with them is on hold for now, but don't worry. Goku gave me enough exercises to keep me busy until he gets back. He even helped me come up with an idea for a new attack. When you wake up, I will be strong enough to protect you. And then I'll keep getting stronger until I can protect everyone. Ah, if you want to stay here I mean. We can go anywhere you want, I've told you that before. But, I hope that you like it here. I think I want to stay. Having friends, it's nice. I don't really want to have to give that up. But you're my priority, so no matter what I'll stay with you. Kagura risked a glance behind her to see what Paula Yusika was doing. There was no possible way that the healer would let her feed her brother the broth while he was unconscious, so if she wanted to give it to him she would have to wait for her to get distracted by one of her projects. No luck yet. We still aren't sure if you will be able to walk with how your spine is right now, so I thought that you might need a way to walk around. I just finished it today after training. Kagura gestured over into the corner where a small wheelchair sat a day. It was obvious how stitched together it was, barely more than a metal frame with a couple of cushions tied onto the seat and the back. The wheels looked stable enough, but it was clear that they had been forcefully put together. They had not begun their life as wheels, but had been recycled into the job. It wasn't like there was a lack of spare scrap metal in the area. No one would notice a few missing bars, 
especially when they had been made unrecognizable with the help of some fancy gravity manipulation. If you can't walk right away when you come back, I'll be able to push you around wherever you want so you aren't just stuck in bed the whole time. I can even use my magic to move you around without having to actually push. She stared long and hard at the chair, her face pensive, as she slowly started to pet her brother's forearm. That way I can walk beside you, if you don't want to look like you are relying on me too much. I don't mind relying on you. Kagura's entire body froze. Oh, so slowly she turned her head, desperately trying to strangle the part of herself that was telling her that she was hearing things. Simon's eyes were glazed over, but he still managed to draw up the strength to smile. Oh? Simon Yur, I can't believe this is I am Yuri, Paula Yusika. Simon's awake. He's awake. Come quick, please. More than anything, Kagura wanted to throw herself atop her brother and give him the single greatest hug of his entire life, but her common sense barely managed to convince her of the danger of squeezing a man with a damaged spine, and she contained herself by grabbing onto her hand with both of hers and squeezing for all she was worth. Simon. Simon. Please be real, please don't be a dream. I can't believe you're awake. Kagura, I never thought I'd get to see you again. You've grown up so well. I'm glad. Chapter 49, The Underwhelming Six Part 3, Royally Screwed Angel watched as the pink cloud of suffocating soft will envelop the ugly gremlin and nodded in satisfaction. You um, mistress? Shut up, Ares, she snapped, making the spirit flinch. Oh dear, that's just no good. Angel stared, that bald head was jutting out of the ball of fluff, staring at Ares in sympathy and not looking the slightest bit suffocated. Without a grunt or any other sign of effort, the rest of the mage's potato of a body stepped out of the wall. Bob turned back to Angel. You know, you really shouldn't be so quick to silence your spirits, he chided, wagging a finger at her. They tend to be quite knowledgeable. For example, I do believe Ari's darling was about to tell you that her attack wasn't going to work. He did an odd little skip that carried him across the clearing and suddenly his hand was in Ari's stomach. Oh? Ari's blinked, but didn't look pained, as though Guildmaster's hand had phased through stomach. Bob gave her a warm smile. It seems to me that your new summoner isn't much of a patch on your old one, dear. But don't you worry your cute little horns about it. I'll personally see to it that your third time is the charm. He reached up and patted her on the head with his free hand. Now don't move, dearie. This won't hurt a bit. He brought the hand up through her body and Ari's vanished. Angel felt the golden key in her fingers go cold, the clear sign that the spirit connected to it was unavailable to be summoned. She stared at it in disbelief, giving it a few waves to for good measure in a vain effort to call the ram spirit back. Oh, don't look so shocked, dearie. The man's voice was warm and friendly, but something about the way he was looking at her rubbed her the wrong way, as though had seen everything about her and found absolutely nothing worthwhile. If you get to be my age, you tend to find you've picked up a trick or two and I've always had a fondness for summoning. Used to have a few spirit keys myself, back in my younger days, he sighed happily. Until I passed them on to the next generation, of course, and his voice became colder. On that topic. Gate of the Scorpion, open. Angel screamed, holding up another key. A man with a giant scorpion tail materialized. You know, I was on a date with Aquarius, he began, reproachfully. I don't care. Angel screeched. Kill him. Okay. Okay, Scorpio turned back to Bob, raising his tail. Sorry, my dude. She's the summoner. Don't worry about it, handsome. Bob waved him off. You just do your best. Oh, thanks. The scorpion man shot a blast of burning sand from his tail. The blob of a guild master didn't react as it slammed into him. Then he stepped forward, walking through the torrent of sand as though it wasn't even touching him. 
Tell me, dearie, Bob said, looking past the confused spirit to Angel. Have you ever heard of phase magic? It's not a well-known skill, but I've always had a knack for it. He reached Scorpio. Now you, young man, have a lady waiting on you. Why don't you run along and attend to her? He stuck his hand in the scorpion's face and the spirit melted into starlight. Bob looked at Angel. Now, dearie, I do believe I have been very patient with you so far. Angel swallowed. This couldn't be happening. This blobby wad of flesh had just defeated two golden keys. That wasn't possible. She took a step back, then another. Does the name Karen mean anything to you? Angel clutched at her keys and felt one of them warm up under her touch. She felt a burst of relief. Her trump card was ready for action once more. Gate of the twins, open. Angel roared. She'd show this creepy bastard just who he was messing with. There was a puff of smoke and two blue figures popped into existence identical in every aspect except one had a bandage wrapped around his head. Oh, it's you, said one. What do you want, said the other. Angel pointed. Kill him. Do we dash? Have to. Now, she roared, waving their key threateningly. There was a burst of smoke and then there were two horrifically ugly old men in the clearing. Angel wrinkled her nose, but said nothing. There was no mage alive so powerful that they couldn't be equaled by Gemini. Then with her there to provide extra power, the scales would always tip in their favor. She grinned at the old man. Karen, she asked. Never heard of her. Unless you meant that green-head bimbo of a summoner, who thought she could take me without being able to summon a single spirit. In which case, yes. I killed the bitch and she died screaming just like you're about to. She sneered. Any last words? Bob sighed, crossing his arms and pouting. You know, he said reflectively, there is a lot of ugliness in the world. It comes in all shapes and sizes, but generally I've found that the really nasty kind tends to be found inside the most beautiful people. He sighed. My guild is full of quite a few beautiful little darlings, and most of them are decent little cherubs. Those that aren't I do my best to steer right. But every now and then you find those who just can't be helped. Gemini, Angel rolled her eyes, just what she wanted, to listen to the ramblings of a fat wad of flesh. Just kill him. Bob turned to his doppelganger, as the spirit stepped forward. The older mage held up a hand with thumb and forefinger an inch apart. Tell me, handsome, do you know what I'm about to do next? Gemini paused mid-step, their eyes screwed up in thought. Then they went wide. Oh? Indeed. Bob said sweetly, sticking his finger in his mouth and letting out a piercing whistle that seemed to carry on long after the mage stopped blowing. Angel raised a second key defensively, ready to summon a spirit to shield her from the oncoming attack. But none came. She looked at her spirit questioningly and saw that Gemini was looking up at the sky. Angel looked up and what she saw took her breath away. There was a horse in the sky, galloping down from the clouds and held aloft by a pair of white wings. Feathers floated in its wake and it glowed with an inner light of untamable radiance. Angel could feel her eyes tearing up, it was the single most beautiful thing she had ever seen. The horse's hooves touched ground and it cantered to a stop beside the old mage. It tossed its head, its flowing manner the very picture of majestic elegance. It looked ethereal, seeming to shimmer in the sunlight, yet the way it stood spoke of unyielding solidity. This is Pegasus. Bob said, somewhat unnecessarily. He's an old friend of mine. I did say I dabbled in summoning, didn't I? he reached up and patted the side of the horse's neck affectionately. Isn't he beautiful? Gemini. Angel whispered. Take it. I want, no, I need it. The order forced the spirit into motion, and it flung its hand up to command the horse to move to her side. The angelic equine didn't budge. 
It snorted, tossing its head in scornful dismissal. I'm afraid that's not going to work, dearie. Bob said. Pegasus is not a celestial spirit. He is not bound by contract to come when I call. He is only here by his will and his will alone. His eyes went hard again, a vein throbbing visibly on his skull. He is not something for you or any other to play with. He turned to the steed and held out his hand. My lord, would you be so gracious as to lend me your aid? The horse tossed his head, bending that long neck down to touch the mage's pudgy hand. The horse changed, turning into light that held the shape of a winged horse for just a moment before flowing into the mage. The light enveloped Bob, flowing around him before gathering on his back. The tiny fake angel wings sewn to his shirt began to grow, stretching out into full-sized wings of divine beauty. They flapped once and Bob lifted off the ground, his figure lit up from behind with radiance. Angel's knees went weak and her hands fell to her side, the keys dropping from her still fingers. Revulsion and rapture warred within her, she wanted to tear her eyes away, while also never wanting to look at anything else. An angel, she breathed. There will be no more words, dearie. Bob said serenely, and there was something different about his voice as well. Like something else was speaking through him, something beautiful, something divine, something wrathful. There will be only judgment. Only, me. The avatar beat its wings and several feathers shot out, piercing Gemini's body. The spirit didn't scream, didn't make a sound, vanishing in an instant as their key went cold. Then it descended on her and, as its wings eclipsed the word, Angel could do nothing but stare and feel the sting of tears pour down her cheeks. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
He twirled the knife around. Your magic has to run out eventually. I bet if I stab you enough times it will work in the end. How many will it take? One thousand. Two, he shrugged. I can do a million in the blink. Of an eye and you'll still never hit me. Then Juvia will just have to hit everywhere. Water catastrophe. Magic circles lit up the air around her, and a high-pressure wall of water shot out in every direction. To her amazement, the dark mage leapt up and skipped along the top of the water stream until he landed in front of her again. Lady, come on, he shook his head. Everyone tries that. He lifted the knife, but as I said, I'm the Fars Dash, there was a solid crunch as a fist-sized rock struck the dark mage in the leg, sending him sprawling with a shriek of pain. Juvia blinked and looked around. She saw Jura wave to her. My apologies, Madame Juvia, for interfering in your fight. The wizard saint called from across the field. I was observing your battle and saw that your movements were unnaturally slow. I believe your opponent was hampering your abilities, and I could not allow the fight to continue with you unable to fight back. He bowed to her, then the ground at his feet turned squishy. You're looking away from our fight. The block-faced man's head popped out of the ground like a gopher. How rude. I will have to charge you one million jewels for improper battle etiquette. Excuse me, madam. Jura said politely and turned back. Juvia blinked, then looked back to her opponent, who was on the ground, cradling his broken leg. He sensed Juvia's stare and looked up at her. What, he demanded, teeth clenched in pain. You mean to tell Juvia that you are not fast, you merely make others slow, she asked flatly. What of it, he answered defensively. That still makes me the fast dash. Waterlock. The dark mag's last words came out as a gurgle, as a bubble of water formed over his face. Juvia huffed. This was no good. This was no good at all. While she could not resent Jura for his assistance, it would have taken forever to bring down this idiot mage on her own. It also meant she couldn't claim the victory. What was she supposed to tell Grey? That she brought down a high-level dark mage with the assistance of Wizard Saint. Oh yes, that was impressive. It made her body start to boil in frustration. She needed to do something, find one of the big names now, before her comrades staked their claim. The rain woman cast her eyes around frantically. The forest was only getting messier, as spells flew and fires started, trees were sinking into the ground all around, or otherwise toppling onto the mags milling around, it was a disaster zone. Then she spotted him, hanging at the edge of the melee on a floating carpet, and apparently asleep. It was him. That, sleepy person. Okay, so Juvia didn't actually know his name, but he was a cease and therefore a priority target. She made a beeline for her prey, sweeping away any stray dark mags that got in the way and tossing them aside in her wake. She came to a stop above the man, who snorted and rolled over on his carpet. She raised her hand to blast him into pulp, but paused. Now that Juvia thought about it, if she took him down while he was sleeping, that wouldn't be impressive at all. Having no choice, Juvia reached out and tapped the man on the shoulder. Excuse Juvia, could she have a moment of your time? The sleeping mage just kept on snoring. Juvia frowned, she didn't have time for this. She needed him to be awake so she could beat him into unconsciousness. Reaching down, she took a fistful of the flying carpet and gave it a solid yank, pulling it out from under the mage. He landed on his head with a painful thump. Ow! Was it, he opened his eyes and blinked at her. The mascara around his eyes making him look like some kind of depressed panda. Who are you, he yawned, rubbing the back of his head sleepily. You one of our minions. Juvia is Juvia, said Juvia. You are one of the cease, yes. Yeah, the sleepy man's eyes narrowed, glancing past her to the fight raging on behind her, understanding dawned on his face, he leered. You one of those idiot light guilders come to stop us. 
Yes, yes, Juvia is here to beat you to pulp, Juvia said, waving her hand dismissively. Are you strong? The man chuckled. Lady, he said, getting to his feet. You have no idea the kind of pain you're about to be in. I'm the strongest member of the seats and dash. Excellent. Waterlock. The man went bug-eyed as water enveloped him, whatever he was about to say coming out as a stream of bubbles. He stared at her, nonplussed, then his eyes narrowed and the water parted, leaving him soaking wet, but unharmed. Okay, I was just going to kill you, but now I'm going to make your last moments a waking nightmare. Juvia has no use for the delusions of an emo panda. She held up two hands. Water stream. A high-powered water jet that could bust through steel shot straight at the man's chest. He yawned and, once the water got within a meter of him, it twisted out of Juvia's control, arcing around him and demolishing a boulder behind him. Juvia blinked. You don't stand a chance. The dark mage said, after mouthing the words Emo Panda to himself and shaking it off. The power of my magic deflector is unsurmountable. The absolute perfect defense. A vicious grin spread across his face, your death comes at midnight. Juvia frowned, glancing up at the sky. It was overcast, but she could see the sun attempting to peek out from behind a cloud. But it's midday. She pointed out. Was he stupid? The man scowled, Midnight is my name. Oh? Juvia blinked. Your parents actually named you Midnight? Juvia asked. They must not have liked you very much. I've had enough of you. Midnight snarled, taking a step forward. Juvia shot a blast of water at him on reflex, and he grinned. Instead of arcing past him, the water bent around him forming a circle. My deflector isn't just the ultimate defense, he leered as the water sped up. It's an unbeatable weapon, too. Now die. The water shot back at her, moving so fast it seemed to cut the air in front of it. The water hit Juvia and shot through as her stomach turned to water, the stream shot across the battlefield, narrowly missing Hot Eye, who lunged aside at the last moment screaming something about monetary recompense. Midnight stared. This is something Juvia's body does. Juvia supplied sympathetically. Racer had the same expression. But if all you can do is throw Juvia's magic back at her, you might wish to give up, because she is fully prepared to drown you until your magic runs out. She tapped her foot and a geezer shot out from under the dark mage's feet, only to part around him. Juvia frowned and brought the split stream of water back around for another blast. Midnight scowled, stepping out of the way of one of the blasts and sending the other back at her to little effect. Your powers are stupid. Midnight complained. Stop not dying when I kill you. Stop not suffocating when Juvia drowns you. Juvia shot back, firing off a few more blasts at him. Water Slicer, the Dark Mage deflected one of the water blades, ducking beneath the others, which sliced through the trunk of a nearby tree. The giant tree toppled slowly with a ponderous creak, and Midnight made a desperate dive to avoid it. Juvia paused, staring at the tree and then at Midnight. Can you only deflect directly magical things, she asked. Midnight just glared at her. Juvia will take that as a yes. Concentrating hard, Juvia formed several hands of water and made them pick up several boulders that dotted the battlefield courtesy of Jura. She made the hands toss the rocks up and catch them a few times. So, do you have anything to else to say before Juvia pummels you to paste? Midnight twitched, a vein throbbing on his head. He tilted his head to the side and his eye began to glow. Then the sky turned red. Juvia started, the water hands falling apart as everything around them caught fire. Your doom comes at midnight. The dark mage's body began to swell, muscles bulging out as his skin turned black until he towered over her. Any last clever words before I kill you? Juvia thrust her hands out, intent on drowning him. The dark mage laughed. 
There's no water left for you to use, little mage. I've deflected you into another reality. My reality. Juvia thinks that sounds stupid. The monster paused, glowering at her. Also, Juvia still has water. No you don't. It's all gone. Juvia is water. Juvia jet. Juvia shot herself forward, slamming into the monster's chest and throwing it backward. Its back slammed against the fallen tree with a clunk, and the sky turned blue once more. Juvia blinked, looking around. Everything was back to normal. The mags around her were fighting. Jura was attempting to sink Hot Eye, who was cackling about the stock market. Juvia frowned and looked down, Midnight was laying on the ground, his head laying against the trunk with his eyes closed. Realization dawned. None of that was real, she huffed, glaring at the unconscious mage. You just cast an illusion and couldn't deflect my magic while using it. Your powers are still stupid. She kicked him once, then brightened up. Stupid powers or not, he had been a member of the cease. Hadn't he said something about being the strongest? That meant she had taken down the strongest dark mage, that meant Juvia was strongest. She couldn't wait to tell Grey, he'd fall in love with her for sure. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
something enormous was rising up over the treetops. It looked like a city suspended on a set of five giant legs. Jura raised an eyebrow. Leon pinched the bridge of his nose and sighed. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
There was a power surge right before it did that. Goku noted. A bunch of little powers flared up and combined into one big power before it snapped back together. Some sort of power source maybe. Most likely. We can try and just turn it off to begin with and call targeting those to be plan B. Urza said as she drew her blade. For now, shall we fly to the top? Let's do this. Myra Jane said with a wide grin as she unfurled her wings. Goku and Urza both left the ground as well and the three prepared to charge forward when. Bois. Nirvana unleashed a painful wail, and for miles around everyone was forced to throw their hands over their ears. A shroud of purple magic oozed out from its core, coating the entire city. Mira Jane's eyes narrowed as the power of the machine washed over her it felt, familiar. Her eyes went wide, this is soul magic. What? Urza shouted. Are you sure? I practically live and breathe the stuff, Urza, of course I'm sure. We need to move, whatever that is, we need to get out of range right dash. The city fired. A dome of purple rushed out in every direction. Undodgeable. Too fast to outrun. Urza darted in front of her friends and called forth her adamantine armor. Goku and Myra Jane reinforced her, coating her shield in a wall of KI and demonic energy. The dome passed straight through their defenses like they didn't even exist. Likewise, it went straight through Myra and Urza without any effect, and the two girls were left looking confused as the supposed defensive mechanism failed to do anything to them. Goku let out a startled gasp before his head was flung back and a blue glow started to emulate from his eyes and his mouth. What dash? Goku. Urza shouted, turning towards him to do something. She had to do something, even if she didn't know what was going on she had to try to help. Maybe she could shake him out of it. Myra Jane grabbed her wrist and yanked her back before she could touch him. Don't touch him, she yelled, staring hard at the writhing martial artist. It's his soul, it's leaving his body. What? Urza shrieked, trying to wrench her arm from Myra's grip. Why aren't we doing anything? Because we'll make it worse. Myra answered, hauling her back. I can feel his soul leaving, but I can also feel another entering. I can't tell what's happening, but whatever it is we cannot interfere. The two souls might get jolted loose and lost in transition, and then we never get him back. But we can get him back. Urza said, seizing on the last sentence. Myra hesitated, then jerked her head back at the walking city. If this thing can switch souls, it can switch back. But whoever is going to be running Goku's body in a moment is about to snap out of it. Should we restrain him then? We don't know who's about to inhabit his body. Calm down Urza, whoever this is, they are being forced into the situation just like we are. We shouldn't just assume that they are some evil mass murderer or something, her head tilted to the side. The soul feels a lot like Goku's, so it could be someone a lot like him. Friendly? Urza asked. Goku's eyes snapped open and suddenly, the air was filled with the unpleasant hiss of anger and killing intent. Myra gulped. Um, no. Probably not. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
He got squished by a goddamn meteor, because apparently an entire planet of assholes capable of blowing up moons at a bare minimum somehow got themselves killed by a giant space rock. Or, you know, Freezer did it. For the last three weeks he had been asleep in his pod, traveling with two other survivors towards the next planet assigned to them by Freezer. In the cry asleep, one experiences all kinds of weird dreams as they are shuttled from one side of the galaxy to another. He stared at the two, definitely female, figures before him. One had devil wings and long white hair, a succubus, he assumed. The other was dressed like some kind of warrior with metal armor. Vegeta grinned. He could dig it. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
From what this man had just said, her friend was an alien from a race who specialized in combat and genocide. But, he tried to spar his opponents more often than not, no matter how much he loved to fight. He was apparently given a mission to slaughter an entire planet, and he didn't even, remember, why didn't he remember? That, that head trauma he apparently got as a kid. Amnesia. That's, unbelievable. Myra Jane on the other hand, had her brain firing on all cylinders. Urza could not negotiate with people stronger than her, especially not with someone wearing the face of a friend. This was entirely on her, just like what she had said before. A warrior race obsessed with combat and conquest. Goku was supposed to kill the world he was sent to, but he was raised Grandpa Gohan instead. Then some unexplained magic sent him to this world instead, a place that his orders to destroy didn't exist. Then something happened that threw her train of thought on a completely different track. The man glanced down at her chest with an appraising look in his eye. Myra blinked. That look was just so out of place on Goku's place, more so than even the killing intent soaking the air. For as long as she'd known him, Goku'd had the sexual drive of a teapot. It wasn't fair. In any other situation, she would be milking this for all it was worth. Actually, with how few options she had right now. He's our boss. The takeover mage blurted out. Vegeta raised an eyebrow and Myra Jane wished she could take a moment to plan out what to say, but her mouth was already talking by that point. This isn't the planet he was sent to take out, someone over there opened up some sort of magical dimension distortion and sent him here instead. We are in a completely different universe. Vegeta said nothing, so Myra plunged on. Goku wanted to get back to his universe, but he couldn't figure out how. Eventually, he got bored trying to sort it out so he decided to. She shrugged. Conquer the planet. Conquer it. Vegeta repeated, looking mildly intrigued. So, you are his slaves. Myra felt more than saw Urza bristle and silently begged her to keep a lid on it, as it was, her reaction had already made Vegeta suspicious. Time to pull out the big guns. She clasped her hands behind her back and leaned forward ever so slightly, his eyes snapped back to hers and then, just for a moment, a fell a little lower. Myra smiled. Oh, his slaves. No, no. Not us. I think a more accurate term would be, his concubines. She felt Urza stiffen even more and added hurriedly. I am, anyway. She gave him a special kind of grin, one that towed the line of being a leer. He's never felt the need to find another. Not once I'm. She paused suggestively, done with him. That caught Vegeta's attention. You can satisfy a Sai Yang, he asked, looking doubtful, yet intrigued. God, that was such an alien look on Goku's face. And what's she for, he asked, jabbing a thumb at Urza. She's his. Myra tapped a finger against her chin innocently while she desperately searched for a word that would satisfy this guy and keep Urza from exploding, attendant, not exactly bodyguard, because let's face it, a Saiyang doesn't need one. But there's a number of silly rebels who reject to his rule and he can't be bothered to kill them all. He likes watching her do it. She's good at killing things. Is that so? Vegeta asked. He looked at her and raised a hand to his temple, and made like he was squinting at Urza through a monocle. Then he scowled, as though something he was missing something. Is she powerful on this planet? I've seen her single-handedly cut down an army, if that's what you mean. Myra said helpfully. Only one. Vegeta didn't look impressed. Well, she's not his only exterminator. Myra said hastily. I can also get new powers based around what demons I kill. The more powerful they are, the bigger my boost. And yet your demeanor, and the way you flinch from me tells me that your power, is still barely any better than the average Sai Yang toddler. He huffed. Either the demons of this world are pitifully weak, 
Their numbers are so small that hunting them is an impossibility for someone of your level, or you lack the drive to truly increase your own standing. He was starting to look annoyed. He was annoyed, and he was strong enough to blink her out of existence along with the entire forest. So, she did the first thing that came to her mind. She slid forward and glomped him, pulling his arm right between her chest. I just figure there's more fun stuff for me to be doing, you know. She said with a huge smile. There are other fighters in the group. Vegeta looked sorely unconvinced and completely uninterested in the attention she was giving him. That probably wasn't good. Go on then. He said impatiently. Right. Well, there's Kagura, she can manipulate gravity and has been helping him train by increasing his weight a whole lot. There's um, Levi, she's a tactical specialist and is really good at taking out magical traps that the rest of us can't really defend against. Then there's Juvia, she can turn her entire body into water, and she really, likes to, drown, things. Myra Jane trailed off, as she took in the thoroughly unimpressed expression on what was Goku's face. Nothing truly impressive then. In fact, I think it is safe to say that I've killed people capable of every last one of those abilities dozens of times over in my life. I was hoping in a world of magic that I might have encountered something different. At the very least, I suppose that the low-class warrior will be able to produce some interesting cross-breeding experiments. He shook her off and turned away, muttering to himself. This body, there were very few cyans who were unaccounted for at the time of our world's death, and nearly every last one of them was a member of the low class. By his face and age, I'd guess I am currently inhabiting the body of Raditz's brother, Kakaro. If I truly cannot retrieve him, then I see no real reason to dwell on the issue. His power as it is would hardly be worth the effort it would take to try to figure out a way to cross magic dimensional boundaries. I have allowed my brother to live off in exile outside of my command, and I shall do the same thing here, he turned back to them. The way I see it, what this Sai Yang does is of no concern to me beyond the fact that he was affected by something that brought me here. We can get through this with some, light punishment, just to make sure that you two never let this happen again. Neither of them saw him move. There was no twitch, no flinch, not even a single flicker. One moment they were standing beside their friend's body, on guard for any possible battle, and the next they were on the ground, wheezing from the insane pain that suddenly racketed their ribs. Myra Jane and Urza gasped for air helplessly, as Vegeta stared down impassively. Get back on your feet. No warrior worth the title should die from that level of attack. Both of them tried to shift their feet back beneath them, tried to rise, but they couldn't gather the energy. Vegeta started to scowl. My strength in this body is nothing compared to my own. Only the mental portion of my KI came along with me, and even that is more than enough to crush this whole planet. Rise or I take away all you hold dear. It took the meaning of his words a moment to push through the haze of pain that was dulling their minds, but when it did the magic following through the two girls' veins blazed. Demonic and fey, light and darkness side by side, strengthening their muscles, dulling their pain, and forcing them up. Urza glared at the man, eye to eye as the power of the Titania flowed. It wasn't enough, not anywhere close to enough but she glared all the same. I don't appreciate you striking me with the body of my friend. She snarled out. Vegeta quirked his eyebrow and allowed his lip to twitch upwards. At least your spurt outstrips your body. He crowed. No Sai Yang could ever be with anyone weak-willed enough to just stand by passively. At least if my ambitions fail, the Sai Yang lineage will continue on in some fashion. Urza's anger vanished instantly with a blush almost matching her hair. Vegeta chuckled and turned to face the walking city, now just a spot in the distance. Now, what do I have to do to that thing to make it send me back? Well, she didn't want to risk boring him with the technical explanation. We need to break it, there are power sources that repair it in the legs. But if we get in and smash them all, the effect might be reversed, 
and you could go back to normal. No levers to pull, or things to turn off, we just need to destroy it. Vegeta emphasized. That's how this generally goes for us, yeah. Myra Jane agreed. Good. Gallic gun fire. There was a flash of purple. Both girls agreed on that. There was a purple flash, and then the entire body of the walking city was gone. The legs swayed in place before collapsing, kicking up plumes of dirt a hundred feet tall. In just a few seconds, Vegeta felt his connection to his new body begin to waver. It seems I'll be going now. Looks like you two get to live to see another day. There was a flash of blue light from his eyes, and then his body collapsed. Goku opened his eyes to see Myra Jane, and Urza standing over him in concern. Did I fall asleep? He asked in confusion. I, the city shot at me, right? And then I think I fell asleep for some reason. Where did it go? Myra Jane pointed to the smoldering pile, and Goku's eyes widened. Who did that? That would be you, Goku, kind of. Myra Jane moaned. I'm not getting into this right now, but we just got a whole lot of exposition about your backstory dumped on us. I have a backstory. Apparently. And you owe us both big. She continued with a gleam in her eye. Well, mostly me. Urza just stood there and looked pretty. Let's just say that I've paid off part of what I owed you for helping out Elfman, but I think you owe Urza a DA an outing when we get back to town. A nice dinner somewhere, yeah. The white-haired mage's smile was so pure that it almost managed to hide the eye smirk that she was sending Urza's way. The redhead blushed deeper than she had ever before and started trying to stammer out reasons why that wasn't necessary but she couldn't find her voice in time before Goku was nodding enthusiastically at the idea. Sure, that sounds fun. He said with a smile. Then he blinked and cocked his head off to the side. Wasn't Laxus on that city thing? Both the girls. Blinked. Oh. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
PHFFT, he. Ha ha. Wa ha 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 ha. When Zero finally awoke, he had been expecting pained groans, screams of terror, and innocent victims for him to mangle. Instead, he found a white-haired girl standing over the man that had been beating his other half. The blonde was lying on his side, his arms curled up near his chest, and clearly unconscious. Holy shit, you got taken out by a stick. This is the greatest thing ever. The girl continued laughing hysterically, falling to her knees as she lost her breath. Tears actually began to pool around the corner of her eyes. Zero grinned. He couldn't wait until those tears fell for a completely different reason. Laxus got yamchered. Another voice. Zero turned to see the orange-clad man walk up beside the girl. He sparred Zero half a glance before leaning down to make sure that Laxus was somewhat stable. Got yamchered. What's that mean? The girl asked. Ah, I dunno. I kind of just came to me. I think it's got something to do with getting taken out really fast in an embarrassing way. The boy replied. I didn't know there was a word for that. The girl chortled. I'm going to hold this over his head for years. Years? Zero interrupted. Both of the fairy tale mags turned to give him bored, uninterested looks. There won't be years for you to look forward to. This place will be your grave. Oh, stop being so dramatic. Myra scolded. Goku was right earlier you know. Your power might have gone up a whole lot right now, but you've pulled out your trump card way too late for it to matter. We've got you cornered. With a wave of her hands, every last member of the Alliance stepped out from the tree line, surrounding the Dark Mage on all sides. With a snarl, the madman barred his teeth and charged. He was brought down less than a minute later. With Zero's defeat, it was all over. The mags of Lamia Scale and Blue Pegasus returned home, but not before Bob pressed a small package into Urza's hand addressed to one Lucy Hartfilia. Wendy and Carla invited the fairy tale group to travel with them to meet her guild Kate Shelter, who turned out to know more than ghosts, illusions of people from half-remembered dream. She had just enough time to say goodbye before they disappeared forever. Leaving Wendy alone with nobody except Carla. It was Juvia, who took it upon herself to wrap her arm around the girl's shoulders and tell her it was alright. That she knew a home for those who were lost. It had taken her in, and know it would take in Wendy too, if she wanted. After a while, Wendy agreed, and Fairy Tale set off for home with two more than they set out with. Like and subscribe for more.